Can Prozond. You, can you name a different name? Yeah. You can, yeah. There's plenty of names. Where is it? Uh, I think it's so in the garbage can, can at this point. So, oh no, I checked okay. it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Three times. There we go. Third time's a charm. We love technology here. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for your patience yeah. while we worked through our um, video system. Kevin, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So um, we have Kevin Daly participating via telephone today, and we have Thomas Hunt who will be coming, but will be joining us midway. So let's go ahead and um, welcome everyone, and let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to welcome a new planning commissioner to our, our pack today, um, Isaac Workman. So I've asked Isaac to take just a few minutes and introduce himself to us. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, my name is Isaac Workman, and I am honored to be among your ranks and to uh, hold this appointment. Um, I'm thankful to Mayor Wilkinson for uh, extending it to me. And just by way of introduction, uh, my wife and I and our five daughters will have lived in Centerville for two years at the end of this month, and we've loved it. Centerville was always a uh, favorite location to stop on our way somewhere north or <laughs> on the way back from somewhere north when we, we moved up to Centerville from Spanish Fork. And I was convinced then, and I'm even more so now, that someone could live their whole life on Parish Lane and never need anything. <laughs> so I just, and I find Centerville to be, uh, to bear so many similarities to where I grew up, which was uh, unincorporated Utah County. Then it was unincorporated Utah County in the Cedar Hills area. And uh, I just really uh, appreciate the small uh, town feel and pace that uh, we find here. And uh, my children, like I said, I have five daughters. Uh, my oldest will be going to Viewmont uh, this school year. And uh, my uh, other daughters are either going to Centerville Junior High or to J.P. Stewart. And uh, my wife stays very busy home working with them. Um, when I'm not at planning commission meetings by profession, I'm an attorney. And uh, while I have spent time in private practice, uh, my current home is with the Department of Justice. And I'm a federal prosecutor. I'm uh, over the, I'm the gun unit chief in Utah. So I'm responsible for uh, federal uh, gun crime prosecutions in the state of Utah. And so that's what I do during the daylight hours and sometimes the night. And uh, so that's a little bit of an introduction. So I'm very happy to be with you. Well, Commissioner Workman, thank you very much for taking the time to introduce yourself and we're delighted to have you. Thank you. So thank you very much. Okay, moving to the next item on our agenda. Well. Really, that was a deviation. So I will turn the time over to Commissioner Johnson um, for a thought or legislative prayer. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to watch a, I hope it's not controversial, but a, a video by uh, John Stewart who went before Congress and talked about, uh, it was, I, you guys are nodding your heads. I give you, a, I encourage you to go watch it. It's pretty interesting. Things that stuck out to me were, um, that there's, there's some topics that seem to supersede um, partisanship and, and take precedence. I thought it was appropriate tonight because we we're listening to the fire department coming in with their application and um, I've, I've really enjoyed how when they've come in and needed some help, we've been able to extend that. Um, anyway, so I'd encourage you guys to go watch that. It was interesting, it was, it was uh, eye-opening and he also um, commented on the inefficiency sometimes of the system, something that I have uh, uh, agree with and, and feel like we could do a little bit better on. With that comment and encouragement to watch the video, I'm gonna say a prayer as well. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful that we can meet as a planning commission this evening. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to live in this city and this uh, system of government where we can participate in this way. We pray for the Spirit to be with us to help us make good, sound decisions. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize for my voice today. Hopefully everybody can, can understand me. So we're going to start with the first item on our agenda. Um, this is a conceptual site plan amendment. 
um, brought by South Davis Metro Fire Station 83. We're being asked to consider the proposed conceptual site plan amendment for that fire station to make changes to landscaping site improvements on the property located at 343 South Main Street. And I will turn the time over to staff. Thank you, Chair Hammond. Members of the commission, uh, as indicated to you, this is a conceptual plan, but it's really an effort to amend the original final site plan approval granted earlier to the fire station. Um, due to some design changes and parameters, working with Main Street, the apron access and the road front edge, um, and then looking at continuing, my understanding, maintenance and design issues, the uh, fire district would like to amend their approval. Um, in some ways, they're really minor amendments when you, when you think about it, but they do have some design components associated with them. And why that's important is the Main Street, the current Main Street overlay zone is a design-based uh, pattern for development. So there's some strength in the design um, above and beyond just looking at parking and uses and so forth. So they would like to amend that. They've provided a narrative to you to explain it and a set of plans. In summary, um, if you recall, the Main Street design guidelines have a minimum and maximum setback in this case, we're looking at 20 feet. Uh, a portion of the station exceeds and extends further back than the maximum of 20 feet. In exchange of that is the concept of a design element, a plaza, a courtyard, some type of feature design that enhances the public space uh, along Main Street. As you recall, uh, if, if you do, the, the original design of the apron is the area of the courtyard. This is the uh, exit area of the apparatus bay. And there was some uh, scoring and, and design work originally planned. It had a serpentine style connecting with the public sidewalks. Um, that is changing. Uh, they've had to drop the apron in relation to the street, and so it will now function rather than a, what you'd see as a driveway going up an approach and onto a piece of property. This will be dropped down, and so it'll be like a roadway approach. You're entering another roadway. In this case, it's not a road. It's the apparatus bay entrance or exit in this case because the entrance is around the building on the other street. Um, so they'd like to change that. So you'll see the pedestrian walk is straightened out. You'll see a drop of the of the sidewalk with the 80 required ADA ramps through that dropped apron area. Um, they've changed the design of from what I understand and view. They've changed the design to uh, remove much of the decorative scoring, go back to the expansion joint type scoring, but they'd like to uh, take the drive lanes of the apparatus bay and enhance those, I believe in stain, it's, it's, it's not stained concrete, it's, Stained, not, stained colored, not, not colored. colored. Yeah, the difference is stained in color. They will they will stain the concrete with those drive lanes, um, and it's really just kind of a, a decorative way of separating the different individual apparatus bay doors, and so they'll stain that concrete, straighten out the sidewalk, adjust the sidewalk going to the entrance of the building, and adjust the landscaping uh, accordingly to that element. Another element that's a slight change. On the south side, the gap between the building of the station to the property line has, in the, in the past has exceeded our gap of 15 feet. It's somewhere around in 30 feet. They, they extended the apron into that area because the exchange is when you have that gap, you have to add additional features to, for a portion of that gap. They've changed that around, removed the apron. Um, they did... As you recall, there was an amendment to that gathering space, that extended gathering space. They will develop that with a landscaping bed and their station sign. Um, the historical sign idea has fallen off the, off the map. So they will use their, their station sign and a landscaping bed to replace that. Um, we do bring up uh, just a minor uh, issue from my point of view. We do count the number of street trees. We're currently missing one. Um, so they have options uh, to, to, to add a tree, um, and it could be something small and ornamental. The, it, it doesn't have to be in the park strip. It just has to be along the frontages. So they need one additional tree. Uh, the other element, um, because they're substituting down to the minimum, and so they need one additional tree. The other one is a, a waiver process, and I just outlined those 
uh, abilities in the staff report that they would come back to you on the final site plan. Judgment of staff, past design, this design. Uh, again, art is, you know, in the eye of the beholder, whether you think it's really great or not. Um, I think the fire department thinks this is really great, and hopefully they say that, but I think it's a good replacement. And I, it's my opinion that the design, given the topography and everything that we're doing, it sets it off better. It's a, it's a better, better design than originally proved, not cutting on the original, because I don't know if Bill designed the original, but, but I think it is a better design. So we're recommending that you move forward with final, um, but it's pending your view of the code and of course we require a hearing at conceptual so we listen to the public of whether it's complying with our code so our recommendation is consider moving to the next level of final site plan thank you very much corey any questions for staff so what is with the changes what is the um overall distance from the building to the property line it's still 50 feet it's not changing from the original distance oh, okay well, did he say that the with the apron change, what were you referencing? I'm, I might have been confused. You said the apron change that used to be. It, it's draw, it used to be scored concrete, scored decorative patterns in the concrete and a serpentine pedestrian path. And then you said they got rid of the little um, courtyard area. The little gathering space yes. is replaced with the other item added. The, you know, there's a number of items that they can do, and they can cre create a landscape feature that has to be above and beyond just grass. Okay, So that they're, they're replacing that. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? If not, we'll invite the applicant to step forward and speak to this matter. And if you'll just introduce yourselves to us for the record. Uh, my name is Jeff Bassett. I'm the fire chief of South Davis Metro Fire Service Area, and this is Bill Gould uh, with Gould, Archi Gould Plus Architects, and he's our architect for the site. And um, just want to thank Corey and his staff. Uh, we call Corey a lot in email and text and yell and scream. Uh, but Good uh, cop, bad cop, depends it's, on the day. It's, it's, I, I really I want you to know we appreciate all your work on this. So uh, we, we think... You know, I had a lot of hesitation about those score marks to begin with, and uh, we, we believe that this is a, a better design. And the reason why we chose the stain versus the color is we have color at the other stations, and it looks terrible. So we are going to do stain that can be up -kept. You know, we can keep it up and keep that um, enhanced color uh, over then the, the colored stain, the colored cement. So, do you feel like um, it looks dated? The at our other stations where we've had to put in the colored, it's it's now pink, and it looks it just doesn't look very nice with the building, and we have tried to enhance that colored, and it made it worse. So by going just to a stain from the get go, we should be able to keep that color on the runners uh, pretty constant, uh, instead of having it fade and look really not very well. So. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, again with staff, um, with Randy, and um, we had to do a lot of work with UDOT on the on the approach uh, at the at the street. So, uh, just thankful for staff and their and their work on that. Um, we'll, if we need to add another tree, we'll just. I mean, we've got those two trees on the front. Did you see those two small trees on the front? Yeah. So, does the tree need to be added on the front or on the side? Um, they can be placed anywhere. They can be clustered anywhere on your okay. frontages. We're just so planning commissions where we're trying to avoid as much blockage of the fire trucks coming out onto the roadway. So I'm trying not to put as many trees uh, in the front. Uh, we're pretty heavy on 3rd South and around the back, but we are trying to keep the front of it as clear as possible um, because of, you know, we are trying to enhance that design uh, so people can see the fire trucks and the ambulances leaving. So, great, thank you. Any other questions you want to add? for the applicant? So, um, with sort of the design, so just straightening like the sidewalk and squaring up the walks from like 300 south. Is that just because you didn't like the curve curvature, or what was the? It just makes it easier because we are required by the city to put retaining 
water retainment on the south and the north. Um, so we have uh, the no the north is a f the south is a four to one, and the the south is a four to one. The north is a what three? Four to one also. So we're just trying to make it look cleaner as we build those retention ponds in onto the both ends of the building. Okay. So we we're, we are adding some design elements to the front of the not to the front but our front door which would be from Main Street straight into the our front door we're adding a, a decorative bench so people will be able to come up and sit we we uh, we have a lot of requests for photos with the fire department and yes. the firefighters so what we are going to do I think you all are aware of uh, the significance of this address and uh, so what we are going to do is we are enhancing a bench an eight-foot bench right next to the front door and then uh, we are working on some type of uh, something really nice that will pop with our logo on the wall because we have a pretty big space so, so we're going to do some art on the wall and then we'll have a nice park bench there where people will be able to sit down and hopefully have a picture with the logo in the background um, we're having uh, some design elements uh, lasered cut into the bench itself uh, so the bench will be there and uh, we'll have some different features on the front as well that we've added great you indicated that you had some concerns about the decorative scoring on the concrete yes uh, could you speak to those more sure initially on our approval plan uh, the entire apron is scored and that was an element to um, get us to start building uh, and when we score cement the weight of the trucks breaks the cement and it creates really a maintenance uh, nightmare for us uh, at our headquarters division, we were required to score just the entrances, and uh, we're are we ten years. We're maybe ten years into that building, and I'm already starting to replace that cement, and that's without heavy fire engine traffic. That's just day-to-day -day traffic. So the weight of our trucks, uh, at one point, maybe at, there's going to be a point in time in Centerville where I need to bring a ladder into that station. It's eighty thousand pounds. For a ladder truck and that will just break that scoring it, it's not deep enough we can't make it you can make it work you can make it look fine but it's going to create a maintenance nightmare and it's going to boost my budget requirement to maintain cement so uh, we have our Eaglewood station is designed like this but with colored it has the colored runners that come out front and that's the one that's kind of gone pink on us uh, but we're, we're going to try to stain that maybe a darker brown or a darker shade to tie into the, the uh, other paint elements of the building and, and really make it look nice. So, Thank you. The, the, as we go back, we're, we're asking to go back to the regulars. I mean, it will be brushed. We're going to have brush marks in the cement, but it's just regular straightaway. And um, we're going to have a really nice approach. I mean, right now, when we leave the station just two blocks uh, north, uh, we bought them out. It 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 put some wear and tear on the trucks just leaving the building. This is so much better for the vehicles, and um, uh, if I can get rid of the power pole, it'll look really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, on the south end, you've added like a walkway area, and then what is that going to? So what that is is on the south end again. That's another requirement of the city for us to have water retaining. So it's a a retainment pond is what that is and what I what I typically what I see in those ponds is they become swamps I, I'm not a fan of them personally so what we are doing is we're enhancing that by putting a cement runner so that water as it drains to it or as the water drains onto that it will get to that cement and dry quicker or run quicker to the drain so all that is on that south end I is just a just a cement it. runner to, to the drain okay. to try to get the water off the grass and to get not have standing water um, on that end. If we're gonna, you know, we'll have the sign there, our fence line goes along there, but uh, that's what that's for. We didn't think, we, we didn't feel we needed it on the north end, that's why it's not there, but on the south end where we have, the south end has two grates, two significant water drainage grates that are required, mm -hmm. they're big. Mm -hmm. and they'll be surrounded by grass. Uh, we, we felt that if we put a runner in there, it would ho hopefully keep that drier and not make it a kind of a swamp area. Okay. 
I appreciate the bench and I appreciate that you've thought about, um, you know, not only how you're going to use it day to day for your stuff, but how the public is going to see it and utilize it. And like you said, you know better than I do how many photo ops people want when they're there and how many little groups of kids that are coming to see the fire trucks and stuff. So I appreciate that there's a safe place that you've created that is still a place that adds to the look and feel for the rest of the community as well. Yeah, thanks. We're just uh, happenstance. I mean, I guess I should have I should have called, but I just ran, uh, just happenstance. The gentleman that provides the city with all their benches is who we are working with to provide the bench. They're going to be do, doing a bunch uh, some laser uh, cutting, and ha we'll have our name in it. We'll have the 343 in it, some other elements to the bench. Cool. It'll look really nice. So great. Don't forget the lighted bollards just for. Randy's oh, sake. Yeah, just uh, during discussions with staff, you will see that on the corners of the apron, we have some bollards, lighted bollards there. And one of the discussions that we had, and it's, um, we're still working with our vendor because it's turning out to be really pricey. But if I can make it work, our intent is to make those a flashing bollard when the trucks are leaving. So what that will do is we will create uh, through media and our, and our social media and all those elements that as the rigs are leaving those bollards on our side of the property will flash and that will alert pedestrian traffic and vehicle traffic that the emergency equipment's coming out. It would only be activated during emergencies not if they're just you know sometimes the, they'll come out and run around the block and go out back to do a truck check but if they're going out and on an emergency call uh, our the discussion with staff and um, just so you know, there's a market for this because nobody does it. <laughs> so it's proving to be a little pricey. But if we can make it work, that's our intent when you see those bollards. They are actually a strobe bollard that will strobe a color, red, white, yellow, blue, something that we will educate. So as we have, you know, this is a heavy foot traffic area with kids. And uh, hence, that's why we cemented in the, the power pole because I didn't want people falling off and rolling an ankle, right? So uh, that, that will be an added feature. Um, if I can't make them strobe, we'll still have the bollards there as a nice light. Um, our sign that we're putting in, we're working with a local sign company in Centerville, uh, and that will have a really nice uh, white halo around it at night with our name laser cut into the sign. So the sign will be lit, uh, kind of a halo effect at night and uh, it should look really sharp out there on that uh, south end as well. Great, thank you so much. Any other questions for the applicant? Is that a GoFundMe account? Um, yeah, it is, <laughs> along with mowing around the trees. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> thank you very much. This matter has been scheduled for a public hearing, so we'll take the opportunity to open the public hearing and invite any member of the public who wishes to speak to this matter to step forward. And seeing no one step forward, we'll close the public hearing. Um, any other questions for staff? Any further discussion or debate? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. Uh, yeah, I'll do this one. Um, chair, I hereby make a motion that the Planning Commission should accept the conceptual plan to amend the original SDMFD station number 83 final site plan of September 18th, subject to the directive uh, one in the staff report with the suggested findings of the reasons for action A and B uh, as found in the staff report. I second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion or debate? You know, I think um, there's been a lot of, of talk about this part of the city, and I think that the um, addition of this fire station is going to be great for this area. I think um, there's been a lot that the fire, um, that they've had to do to make this work, <coughs> but I also think that it's important that this is done because this is such a big part of that area. And we appreciate that, um, while it may not have always been easy to get to where we are right now, I appreciate that um, you're willing to make it work to not only you know, see the things that are going to work for your station, but also uh, what's going to eventually be good for our, our community. Our community wants to see a nice place. We want to have a nice new station that was reflective of our values and of 
of how it feels in Centerville. So um, I'm in support of it. I also think, you know, I'm a big fan of street trees. I have said that lots and lots, but in this particular instance, this is, a, I think, a smart move to um, eliminate street trees just for safety concern of, you know, trucks pulling out and making sure that we can see visibility and everything. So I appreciate that, um, you know, we, we moved those to the other side and instead of having them in front and I, with the extra tree there, we can add, I think that that's a good, um, comp, a good way to approach it, so. Thank you, any further discussion or debate? And I'll note that Commissioner Hunt was able to, to join. We, we noticed that you were gonna be here a little late, so thank you very much for coming in. We have a complete planning commission, all seven of us, for the first time in a long time, so. For we the are last time for a while, yeah. right, Kai? Yeah. Is this, your, is this your last one? I think this is, I'm not positive if, uh, for the next one, but July, I'm, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, I thought I knew that you were out in July. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take a roll call vote. Um, Commissioner Daly, we'll go ahead and start with you. Aye. And now we'll start down uh, with Aye. Commissioner Hensi. Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, moving to the second item on our agenda, and we're being asked to consider the proposed conceptual site plan amendment for the Island View Park renovation, phase one and two on the property located at approximately 750 East, 500 South, and we'll turn the time over to staff. Thank you, Chair, members of the commission. Um, this is a city park, so we like city parks. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go through the review and make sure we're up to par with the zoning ordinance. Uh, just for your information, this is well under underway for construction and, and or not constructing, but to, to be constructed, and Bruce, our parks and rec director, can answer <coughs> questions of what's going on. But it's located in our public facility low zone. Uh, the planning commission is charged with looking at the conceptual and final site plans for compliance with the zoning ordinance. Um, I try to outline all the interesting parameters of a public facility zone. You're probably not as familiar because we do not generally have a bunch of parks being constructed, even though I think some residents would love that. Um, so there's, there's some interesting nuances in the, in the public facility, particularly addressing accessory buildings and so forth, I, f I found kind of fascinating. Uh, those limitations. My review of, of the facilities that would be applicable to the accessory buildings, they should all be in compliance with the, with the limitations, but if we had an outdoor um, amphitheater or something like that, we might have to figure out how we wade through that process, but, but I, I don't think so in this case. We should be okay unless Bruce tells me otherwise. Uh, I think the largest issue f uh, for the Planning Commission is really the issue of parking. Um, I think that's uh, highlighted in the staff report. Uh, the reason being is, is with parks, we don't define uh, 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 how much parking should be in incorporated. Various uses of parks, if you have a, a complex of sports facilities, you're going to have a very different style of parking than a small neighborhood park. And so the uh, code requires a, a study be performed for the style of park. Keep in mind this is uh, not just a neighborhood park, even though it's probably considered mostly by a neighborhood park. It is a community park under the label of our general plan. So it is intended to, to be a uh, uh, more than just uh, turf grass. It's the idea that this is a community facility in the south part of the city. And uh, so we look at the type of uses that are taking place, study the parking for those type of uses, and try to match those up together. And uh, so I outline in the report what the ordinance is looking for in the study. And uh, I think um, our Parks and Rec Director can, can um, maybe answer any questions of, of how they would proceed forward. But other than that, we think it can move from conceptual to the final site plan with those directives. A lot of what the direct is is just FYI, keep this in mind, don't exceed this, keep that in mind, don't exceed this parameter. I think the largest is, is the parking study. Uh, with that, I'd let you have design questions of the park that I assume you might have, and Bruce is here to be able to answer those questions. Okay, thanks. Let's first, before we bring you up, um, are there any questions for staff? All right. 
I, I do have one. Uh, Corey, do you know offhand how many parking spaces are currently at Island Park, Island View Park? I did not count the lower lower part. I don't. Maybe Bruce knows how many are in the lower part. Why don't I have you go ahead and step to the mic if you'll introduce yourself and then just repeat that so that we have it on the record. Sure. Bruce Cox, the Centerville City Parks and Recreation Director. Um, the question of your par of parking, um, I, I've, since I've been working for the city, we've built um, uh, Porter Walton Park, Freedom Hills Park, and we remodeled um, what was Founders, now Smith Park. And in, in both this, this Founders Park and the um, Porter Walton Park, we same had the same question, how many parking stalls do we need? Because we were in both those situations, the school wants, wanted to use the, the parking for, for their needs and the um, library, uh, we share a parking lot with the, the Davis County Library. And so we need to know, okay, how many parking stalls does the city need to ex uh, plan on for park use and then, and then let the county figure how many they need for their library use. So we, we did, we had people sit in the parking lots to, on weekdays and then on weekends and at different times to count cars and, and uh, felt that 15 parking stalls, uh, and just to, uh, as reference, the Founders Park is about a three and a half acre park and the Porter Walton Park is a little over four acres. And um, uh, this, this park is uh, also a little over four acres. Uh, uh, well, and I'll talk to also the phases in just a second also, but um, 15 parking stalls is about what we've, we found that uh, they, they never exceeded that uh, in all the different times that we were counting cars and things uh, with um, groups that were coming and things that, that uh, um, 15 was, was more than enough. It's, it's not more than enough when there's back to school night or other things, it, it overflows, but uh, for regular park use on a, on a weekly basis, uh, 15 parking stalls was more than enough. So. Um, this this uh, park had about 30 on this down at the the street level, and it had four um, that you could drive up. One was a handicap stall, and then a sidewalk in, and then three other regular parking stalls at the Bowery level, and then up on the top level, there's uh, uh, between 25 and 30 uh, stalls up there. Uh, this plan takes away that street level um, 30, the, and and I might add that rarely ever got used. As a matter of fact, it got used probably more by, as overflow from the cemetery than it, than it ever did for the park. Um, just because it's inconvenient. If you park there, you have to hike up a pretty good uh, flight of stairs to get to the Bowery level. Um, so this new plan takes away that street level parking and extends out the, the hillside slope in an effort to try to make the park a little more visible from the street. Um, making that slope a, a little less and puts 19 parking stalls on the Bowery level. So you've got your four plus another 15. And then, uh, and then the parking lot at the, at the top level stays the same and it doesn't change. So I, that, uh, and we still plan, I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I, there isn't in the study from the um, Institute of Traffic Engineers that I, I checked, it's from 2004, so I've got uh, ESI engineering looking to see if they can find some more current data, but uh, it currently says, it doesn't have uh, ratios for a park, but it has it for a uh, tennis club or racket club complex of with four courts, and it recommends uh, four and a half parking stalls. <laughs> so uh, per, per, uh, per court, so it'd be uh, nine, nine parking stalls. So, um, uh, so the parking up top stays the same? Yeah, nothing changes with that. And then we just have the added at the Bowery level, Right. take away the base, but, but the added is a little bit less than what it was down at the lower part. Right, right. Okay. And parks, cars would be allowed, to, as, as on any street, to park right. along parallel parking on that street, but actual parking lot stalls, there's 19 on that Bowery level. Okay. And two, two of which are handicap stalls. So for reference, when we're looking at this, the other parking stalls are not shown on here. Right, so. And um, they're up. So you'll, you'll actually. Past the project limit line. Right, it's not, because nothing's yeah. changing with it, it's not part of the project. Okay. Um, this was broken into two phases because we applied for a federal grant and uh, in advice from the state, they said, you know, if you apply for half of the amount of this whole project, you're not, you won't get selected. But if you cut your, cut your project into a phase one and a phase two and just apply for the grant for phase one, you have a pretty good chance. And so we did that and we got the grant. So this, this project actually has a $670,000 federal grant, the matching grant that, that is helping to pay pay for a big chunk of it. Um, 
but uh, the original plan was to do it all all as one project but um, so in our efforts we have we have designers and we have a, 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 a contractor and the plan is that as they uh, put in their bids um, for phase one we asked that they would do unit costs and things so that we can give the plans of phase two to the same contractor and move right into phase two and as far as the public would know it's it's really all going to be done at the same time but uh, because of the federal grant requirements we have to keep all of the um, purchasing and right. all, all the receipts separate of what's phase one and what's phase two how interesting it goes to your earlier comment logan about the inefficiencies <laughs> of government yes. but yeah. yes it is yeah. um can you there's on the south side of this you've got these blue and red um circles can you remind me what's going to be on the south end okay so that that's the highlight of the the remodel of the park the if you're familiar with island view park it has three levels top level with the parking we talked about middle level is tennis courts and a playground uh, and a bottom level where there's a bowery and right now hand, some old handball courts and um uh and a sand volleyball and then there's the slope down to the street uh, uh this this um, plan shows a three-level playground that all the levels are connected with climbing features and slides down the slopes down the hills so i i think this park will become known as the you know as the three-level playground or the or you know the the play the the park with the three three different levels and um, i don't know of another playground around the the uh, bountiful just um we call has it a, a triple play the, yeah triple play but, yeah there <laughs> you go play park. the um <laughs> creekside <laughs> creekside park just south of bountiful high school yeah. has a two-level playground where they've connected the two levels with the bridge and cl and slides and this this will this will be one more level so someone but it's to, similar to that right the designs uh, it's very very much uh, some of the designs yeah there um we won't have bridges that go um high bridges that go between levels but definitely climbing features and slides and those big circles are uh rubber half half spheres um so it adds kind of a feature you can go around these half spheres and hide or jump up on them or run down them and just to add texture to the playground instead of a flat uh, uh playground you'll have big balls of different shapes that are halfway you know halfway out of the ground do you know how many parking stalls is at this other park that'll be similar to this one? Oh, creekside yes um, not enough because every time i've gone there they have big signs that say park parking only not for yeah. bountiful high school students that's <laughs> i guess my my one question or concern <laughs> or comment or take it however you would like is if it were just the the tennis courts I would think okay this is just another park but this one could be a big draw because yeah. it is unique and for the reason that you say and so i would encourage you to be very careful and be conservative as you're thinking about parking and sure. look to other similar parks that might give you a better sense as opposed to just looking at the 4.5 my, my guess is that park has right around 20 25 parking stalls yeah. um, but it, it it's right across the street from the high school and so they have a problem with uh, lots Understood. of kids driving and not enough um, parking stalls for the high school students so as far as i know the park has it doesn't have an issue with with parking they also it's con part of a uh, connecting mountain bike trail that goes all the way along a river riverside so it also has people who it kind of serves as a trailhead too for their, that park bruce the tennis courts then are being moved to the top tier, right? Right now they're in the center tier. No, they'll they'll stay on the same tier. What what they're being shifted to the north. So right now there's two tennis courts yeah. with a playground on the north side. Yeah. That playground goes away. The tennis courts shift to the north with a, a center sidewalk going between. Right now the the courts don't have a sidewalk between them. If you want to cross from one side to the other, you have to walk all the way around the court, or you have to walk across somebody's court. But so that's a, an a improvement where they're putting in a sidewalk down the middle that's fences on both sides. The tennis courts shift to the north, and then all the playgrounds are on the south side. On the north side, how, how close is it to residential? On the north side, um, so so that line you see the farthest north line is a back fence line of of the backyard of the of the neighbors and their yard, their lots are uh deeper than average um so uh, where where we have tennis courts now in the city with lights do the, do the neighbors ever complain about the lights the the, the light um complaints i get are from the south side um there's the uh, a neighbor there um and only complaints i get are, are when uh and whenever there's a power outage the clock gets off 
slightly off, and so she'll call to let me know that hey, they're not they're not shutting off at ten o'clock anymore. That you know they're they're staying on till ten or eleven or, 11 or twelve. Um, so, yeah. So if you look, oh, okay. actually, um, yeah, just to the south of those those tennis courts at the bottom of that screen, um, those that's right. the backyards of those homes. So we're actually moving the tennis courts farther away from those people's backyards, and there's still quite a quite a good uh, buffer between the the. Um, neighbors on the north so it's improving that situation okay bruce the top level of that uh triple play park does that connect to the upper level of parking yeah so so you can see on that picture the the parking lot at the top it, uh -huh, the, in the uh it would be the northwest corner of that parking lot that section of grass is where the top level of play playground goes and then the the connection goes down the slope yep Wow. So, yeah. so you could park at the top, yeah. let your kids out, right, and then have to go to the other lot because you don't want to take the stairs to pick them up. Type of thing. Well, so, <laughs> so actually that's one of the changes we had to make in the, in the design. The design didn't show um, a connecting sidewalk following the playground levels, and so, so we were worried about that, that um, a mom might let her kids out at the top, and shoosh, they're, they're gone, and they're two levels down, and she has to go down the, the uh, sidewalk over by the tennis courts in order to get mm -hmm. to that level. So that was a change that we made to the uh, concept plan is it now has a uh, winding sidewalk that goes all the way along the playground oh, wow. side on the yeah. south side. Uh, that's actually one of the, the best improvements of this uh, remodel is there will be a sidewalk at the street level down at the cemetery level that is ADA um, compliant that will wind all through all three levels. So someone can push a stroller from the top to the bottom or a wheelchair or whatever and without having to do any stairs. And right now the way it is, um, uh, two of the levels you have to, the right. only way to get between them is either drive around or, or take a long flight of stairs. Yeah. So wow. it's a continuous sidewalk that yeah. could go all the way around, right. that's great. Yep. Do you have to push the stroller or do you just let go? This one is electric. It's electric. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you resist the temptation to not do pickleball you, courts? You can't, uh, you can't let go. Please, don't we purposely me. made it so that it's not going to be a speed track for skateboards. So you can't let go or they, will, they, they'll, they won't stay on the sidewalk. <laughs> Can, net, net, what are our top three gains? From doing this remodel, what are we gaining? Uh, the, the pl so Island View Park is 40 years old, and the, the playground um, on the top level is original, and the playground on the mid, mid level is at least 25, 25 or 30 years old. So you're getting new playgrounds is, is probably, the, like I say, the highlight. Um, the, the, this park's very hidden. Um, a lot of people in Centerville don't know it's there. Um, it, it, because of the levels, you can't see it from the street as you drive by. <laughs> what? Sometimes it's the only place you can find a tennis court. Too. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that, that is actually one of the changes we've made in the process, too, is we were going to put pickleball lines on the tennis courts. Oh, and please. advice from other uh, from Farmington City and different places said, don't do that because, advice. because they'll, the pickleball will dominate the courts and tennis players won't ever have a place to play. So they said, and we decided this isn't, this isn't the right size <coughs> nor the right place for pickleball courts. We want to do, if we're going to do pickleball courts, we, don't, we want to do it right. We want to put in, you know, eight to 12 mm -hmm. courts all in one place where people can go and enjoy that and, and not, St. George. Not, <laughs> not, uh, not, not ruin, the, ruin the tennis players' uh, facilities. So. Um, so that was one that was advice is don't paint pickleball lines on the tennis courts uh, or else uh, tennis players won't ever get to use it. <laughs> I just had one clarification on the <coughs> size of the park. I think maybe you were just referring to phase one, but the parking calculations will be based upon the entire park acreage. Which is so what is that? Six, six point something acres. About yeah. seven acres is yeah. the whole park. W one change is the top level been, has been um, two small soccer fields uh, with... Um, for I think they play U8 ages. They used to play U8 ages up there. And then there's also a, a small softball field, grass infield with, on the far north end. Um, the the um, soccer field will be changed to just one large soccer field that um, older kids can play up to U12. Um, and, and that was a little bit of an issue in the past because when, when uh, Forza was using that top level to do um, their soccer games, they'd have four little kids' teams playing and their game would be getting over and four more teams were showing up to play the next game on Saturdays or on Wednesday nights. And so it would overflow that parking lot and, um, because you actually had eight teams there um, 
all show, you know, some are leaving and some are uh, arriving. Um, and so by changing it to just one court, one field, the most you would have is, is two teams playing and two teams showing up. And, and that's not an issue right now. Force doesn't use, use that anymore. So we, we haven't reserved it for a few years now for um, soccer games. It's just been for practicing. That's a concern I have for practices. If you just have one, then that's just not going to – I mean, I know my kid practices up there, and he's, un, he's younger. So you're going to basically meet, make it so that only one team can practice there. At a time, one full field. So if they take the whole field, then yes, fields uh, at our community park. Bruce, well, the, the fields that are there, the goals that are up there, they're not really good for some a lot of that stuff. So they're not really used very much. Right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, okay. they're not. Yeah, they're not regulation goals and things. So I imagine unless they are U8, unless they're under the age of eight, they're probably not using those goals. Okay. Bruce, to get to the point where we're at today, I know that there's been opportunities for public input and comment. A lot, uh, quite a bit, I do, I do more than anything we've built. <laughs> I, I, and I do recall as part of that, some time ago there was a city survey or a kind of solicitation for information about different sporting interests, athletic interests, things that the residents of the city wanted to see or were in, are engaged in. Um, what, if any, um, input from that survey went into the layout of this park so so more than any any um demand or or, or uh, request for sports fields was walking paths that that uh, that we found that in in our other parks too that the the walking paths are get used constantly by a wide range of people and um and that's one of the improvements that this uh, as I mentioned before, you can walk from the bottom all the way to the top, and then there's, there will continue to be a, a quarter-mile walking loop around the top level that's, that's been there, and it will continue to stay. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. So lots of serious. Uh, the walking paths seem to be the, one of the highest uh, features on a list of, of parks. When they say when you're remodeling or building a park, make sure you put in a walking path. And, and uh, our community park now has a one-mile perimeter loop that if you want to just stay and continuously do one mile after another, you can do the perimeter of, island, of community park. Or you can do four times around the top of Island View. <laughs> well, so, go ahead. I do share the, some, uh, the chair's concerns for the parking situation and the potential issues that may be arising. Said simply, you becoming a victim of your success, right? You're creating a park where you're bringing a new demographic or greater numbers um, to come and experience this, this new, these new features that, that aren't found elsewhere. And um, looking at the, uh, the elevation here, what, from what I can tell, by eliminating the parking, we have just a sloped grass hill going up to that first uh, tier of um, There'll be lots the of planting, and, lots of shrubbery and planting. Uh, okay, because yeah. Well, yeah, one of my concerns was um, you have like winter sledding or things like that coming down into the roadway. Right. Um, and besides just um, that the ADA compliance sidewalk, which does create an, a more walking area, Besides that sidewalk, if eliminating that parking is just a function of increasing the visibility of the park, or if there are other uh, recreating opportunities associated with eliminating the, the parking. Um, no, other than access and visibility, it doesn't add any more other recreation. That, that whole hillside will be all in shrubbery, shrubs and planting. So uh, that's one of the things we, we wanted to make sure we didn't create a, a sledding hill there. So. Um, so, Bruce, I have access to the ITE manuals for parking counts on there, and it, it, they consider it a, a public park based on this. I don't know what we're considering it, but the counts for a public park is 2.28 parking stalls per acre of oh. park. And so you'd be at like 13 required parking stalls per that. Okay. That land use code thank you the, uh, ESI so, was supposed to get back to me with that but, yeah and have we will at, have them look at code 411 yeah, before <laughs> final that's actually one of the but, issues I'll have to bring for final final um, approval is is the parking study so we, yeah. we might be putting the cart a little bit before the horse right now but the only the only thing is if if I mean that's for a public park if this is technically considered a community park if it would be higher than that or not I don't know um, but I do know with it being a new park remodeled, at least initially, it will generate quite a bit more traffic than 
than what it may in five years down the sure. road. But oh, oh I, I, I imagine. Yeah, I imagine as as work gets that one's finished, hopefully you know they'll have have uh, quite a few people come to try it out. Yeah. And but, I, but, but just the way the plan is now, there'll be 40 plus parkings, probably 45 parking stalls. And also with my short stint on the, the parks committee. I was going to uh, say, they, I've got they, some uh, yeah. alumni. I, I'll, bet, I'll bet you didn't know that Commissioner uh, Johnson is also known as Ninja of the Crescent Moon. <laughs> we, were, we had Porter Walton Park, and so we had a little bit of reputation. We were one of those lazy cemetery crew members that just sat there. <laughs> That's They're, where I was. I was at the I know, cemetery. That's where I, was. <laughs> I was the they lazy were, one. They, they were both equally great employees. <laughs> <laughs> but no, for your, your whole parks committee that, that put this plan together, being at some of their meetings, I know how much hard work they put into it. So. So make sure they, they get recognition. You know, I skipped that, over you know. the, the public involvement. Um, this, this started uh, more than two years ago um, uh, with a, um, a, uh, an effort at the 4th of July and also um, through uh, the city's newsletter that anyone interested in, in throwing in their ideas for remodeling the park to, to uh, give us their email address. And we got 100 email addresses, which is pretty good when you're just asking people for their. And, and so we contacted all of them to ask how, who would like to be part of a focus group and come to a meeting and, and help brainstorm uh, how we would plan out this park. And we got 50 out of that 100 came to, uh, to be part of that focus group. And that focus group met a couple of times. And they you know, all started with pie in the sky uh, stuff and then started realizing, okay, what space we had and what, what things were um, reality and, and, and narrowed it down and, and everybody got, you know, to prioritize one, one vote. And, and, and I, I think we've ended up with a really great product and it, and it did start with that group and then we've had a couple of open houses. Um, um, we've gone through different playground options that, that we uh, offered folks to look at and, and give their input on and things. So. Um, it has had a lot of, of public input and, and involvement. Bruce, I'd like to take this opportunity to put in a plug for a dog park. <laughs> Y'all know that that is near and dear to my heart. I am I'm going to figure out a way to get a dog hey, park. Hey, I have a, I have a point. perfect place where I know a great place where, where we could put a dog park. It <laughs> might not make the residents happy where we put it, but I, I know all the dog owners will love it. There are a lot of dog owners that would really appreciate a dog park, I'm just saying. Um, I know when I was on parks committee, we talked a lot about doing a water feature in a park, and that was nixed for this, right? We that that was that was definitely in the discussion of, of this, and there was uh, no support for that after just th this location. No, we actually have a, a couple of great um, locations where we could do that. Both Smoot Park and uh, Freedom Hills Park have creeks or streams that run through them. And at the Creekside Park that we mentioned at Elver and Bountiful, they also have a creek that runs through that, that. that. They've they've built stone steps and widened out the creek area and made it so it's to, it's made to play in. And mm -hmm. um, I've I've had some ideas of how we could do similar things at Smoot Park, where we we pipe the stream, uh, but then we do a an, a man-made stream that has maybe they're man-made boulders and a cement bottom but it's made to play in mm -hmm. and then we control the amount of water that that runs down the man-made stream that's above ground and then and then what's excess and high flow periods we run the extra through a pipe underneath and and make it into a a, a play feature that's made to play in that's safe uh, and not just a, a a creek running through the park but a, a play feature right. that that doesn't have to go through the sewer or have to be um uh, cleaned yeah, yeah one, fil of the fil filtered one of the controversies and, yeah. is if you do a closed system of a splash pad then you're into the pool regulations yeah. and criteria and maintenance and yeah, the, if debate you of, it, the debate if you run, of that expense is, is... If you run it into wrong. the sewer, it's equivalent of 30 residential homes that you have to pay the fee of, of 30 residential homes for the sewer capacity, even though it's only open for a pe short period of the year, they have to have that capacity all year. And so the, the sewer problem is, is a big deal. So, so then North Salt Lake, they filter theirs, recycle it, which creates its, its own problems. Um, and you have to have a full-time person that, that checks those filters and, and monitors it three times a day and, and um, uh, has to be pool certified and those kinds of things. Um, the, the closest one that I like that, 
that uh, um, Kaysville did is they have one that's on the east side of Kays Kaysville that they run all of the water drains into an irrigation. irrigation canal that then irrigates farmland farther west so they don't have to pay the sewer fee or, nor do they have to filter it. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's, I, I think, uh, similar that's with, we with Rick's Creek about. that runs yeah. through Smoot Park. That water runs on down and is actually irrigation water for uh, property west of the freeway, too. So it, it could be something like that. And if people know it's stream water, you know, it, it's, uh, um, y you, you avoid some of the liabilities as if you're treating it like a swimming pool. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell me, like, the... Let's just, can you just give us a brief overview of the features of the playground equipment? Like you said, you mentioned some of them, but can you kind of help us? Yeah, um, I actually have some, some pictures, if you'd like to see, of, of different things. Um, maybe I just pass this, this around. Um, so uh, one of these sheets is, is some of the planting material that you'll see on that hillside that, that you were wondering if it was going to be grass, and then the other one, uh, shows um, some of those big rubber spheres that are be in the playground, and then uh, I think I have one that has. There's this also pictures of some of the park benches and bike. Um, oh, I might mention the 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 pavilion on the lower level. That is, we're replacing an existing pavilion uh, that's octagon shaped. It'll be replaced with a square shape. It'll have uh, six tables. And then at the top level, uh, uh, there's currently just a small uh, pavilion there that's uh, just a two-table two, two table pavilion that, that'll be replaced with a six-table rectangle shape. Um, uh, I, don't have, I don't have my playground features, but I can tell you, um, you can pass those. Um, there's a, like a hamster wheel uh, that uh, kids can get inside, kind of like the idea of when you get, used to get in a tire and roll, roll, you can get in this, it's stationary, and, it's, and you can get in it and you can move your weight to move it, or, or other kids can turn it while you're in it, and you can go upside down and around in this hamster wheel. Uh, there's another, another little spinny feature that's actually on the ground that's a, 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 just a plate that you can either sit on or stand on, and it's, it spins, and it's on a tilt, so if you stand on one side, you, you spin to the other side. Um, what else? Uh, there's um, the the bigger features are, are actually the climbing <coughs> features, and they're uh, they think there's pictures of the rope, but it's it's uh, rope covered cables um, that make kind of spider webs that, that kids can climb. Um, the the slides will be mostly on the slopes on the hillsides between between the levels. Um, there's uh, Park, park benches along on all, all levels along the playground and also along the, the tennis courts for people that want to sit, sit in the park bench and watch, watch the other kids play. Um, uh, the, the sphere is, the, or the rubber spheres are something that kids can hop from sphere to sphere or, or, uh, or uh, you know, hide behind some of the bigger ones. Um, um, I, I think that's kind of a fun thing that I haven't seen in any other playground around it where the playground has these these big half-shaped balls all around for kids to and, it, and that's a theme that goes all through the all three um, levels is these big balls um, they had they had two different options they had berms um, was the other option and they decided they liked the balls better than the are they the kind berms. of bouncy or are they so, so it's just it's a half ball and it's it's covered with rubber playground surfacing so it's all the playground surface so they don't they don't move other than they're they're a little bit Squishy, so if you jump on it, you know you, it's uh, it gives you a little spring back. Okay. Yeah. And are you using the playground surface that's been used like elsewhere throughout the city? <laughs> yeah. So it'll it'll be a poured in place rubberized surface. Yeah. So it's not loose. And loose how do you like the maintenance on that? We're we're actually catching up. We've fallen behind on on uh, some of our playgrounds and. Um, uh, it, there hasn't been a lot of contractors available to to do the conditioning. What you have to do is every two or three years you do a conditioning layers. Basically, they put a, a clear glue that they roll on with paint rollers over the top of it. It just keeps the surface um, from peeling up and, and uh, coming unstuck. And then we have areas that have already peeled up and, and been um, pull out that have to be patched and then that conditioning level. Uh, but, but still less maintenance than say sand or, um, uh, or wood chips in that those are annual, have to yeah. replace those annually. And um, 
more than 10 times the shock absorbing um, ability of someone falling and hitting their head on the surface as sand or wood chips. So that, that's the real benefit. It's quite a bit more expensive, but uh, your liability of someone falling and hurting himself is 10 times less. Do you so. think that they'll main, be maintained well enough with those rubber, like with those balls? Do you think that will cause any kind of additional wear and tear on those or you think that'll That's be okay? That's a good question. I, I, I think we'll have to watch it and maybe it's something we have to do every year where we do conditioning on, on heavy wear spots or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I doubt it though because the bottoms of slides are really heavy, heavy wear or under swings. There mm -hmm. aren't, aren't any swings in this plan but um, um, there are bottoms of slides and, and that's usually where, where it first starts to break up. So I, would, I wouldn't think a, a ball would get any worse uh, traffic than the bottom of the slide. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? I have a lot of yeah, questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, <laughs> So can I just echo maybe a little bit of what uh, Commissioner Workman was talking about? Well, I have two questions, actually. Um, first of all, uh, talking about the lower level, and, and Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm obviously just looking at the little design here, but it, it doesn't look like we're actually gaining a whole lot on the, kind of the lower level of the park, but we're losing parking. Um, is there a way to... I mean, there's that, a big space there right now between the bottom of that hill and where the road is. Is there a way to push that back in and maybe keep that parking to try and limit the amount of parallel parking that would happen there, especially if we're not going to gain much on that lower level? And then my second question is, um, you and I had talked once about the UISA's legacy field grant process for getting some funding for a soccer field on that top, top level. Has that been explored at all? Is that a possibility for some funding there? And then uh, just to be a favor, I want to answer my question. Uh, try and use your outside voice for a minute. <laughs> on on the um, as far as pursuing another grant, I, we have not. We've we've had our hands full with this the current grant that we have on this project. So uh, we we don't have a, a a grant writer in our city, um, and so it, it it just falls to someone who might have extra time to try to pursue those. But if someone on the planning commission had a little time to to pursue some grants for the parks, that would be awesome. Um, it, the reason why we have the federal grant for this. This is because someone on the Parks and Rec Committee put, put forth quite a bit of effort um, to do some research and find out what was available and how we, what we needed to do. And, and then I, I filled out the application, but uh, quite a bit of the footwork was done by one of our citizen volunteers on our Parks and Rec Committee, uh, Lynn Keddington, um, which got us $670,000, so that's great. Um, uh, there is, uh, I would say there's no um, recreational value to the, the, that far west slope as it is now. It, it's a, kind of a maintenance issue. There, there isn't much you can do with it. Um, and the parking is n not needed. It's, uh, like I say, the, the only time that parking gets used is for the cemetery when there's a, a tragic uh, uh, death and, and uh, a big crowd that shows up to the cemetery. That, that then will start to fill in up there. Um, and the advantage is one of the main problems we have with this park is it's too private. No one knows it's there, which draws uh, Ill illegal activity. We've had drug activity. It's a, you know, our, unfortunately, find evidence of, of mischievous teenage uh, uh, activity going on up there all the time. Um, uh, <laughs> these guys know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, the, the, the restroom, it's, it's unfortunate. We've, we've, uh, restrooms have had needles in the restrooms, condoms in the, in the, uh, the handball courts and things like that. So the, the private part of this park is not a good thing. For a public park, you don't want it to be private. You want it to be wide open. You want a police officer or a citizen that's driving by to be able to see all the way through that park. All of our parks that have evergreens, we, we limb up the limbs on the bottom so that it doesn't create a, a vision uh, blockage for someone to hide under or behind a, a big evergreen, even though they, that's not the, the way I, I like evergreens to look, but that's, that's the way they need to be in a public park because you want to be able to have visibility. So the main push of, of uh, extending out that slope is to make it so hopefully uh, we're softening that slope and making people so they look up and see, oh, there's a park there. Oh, what's going on? I can see people walking up that pathway, or, or maybe they can see the, the, the pavilion. Um, so I, I would, I would um, say 
you're, you're taking away something that you don't need and you're not using anyway for the park of those parking stalls. You're adding parking where you really do need it on the, on the Bowery level. Um, when there's a family reunion or a group or a party of some kind, that Bowery level is where you're hauling your coolers and your, your food and your paper plates and all those kinds of things. Uh, um, and you don't want to park down on that street level and hike up uh, a, a large flight of stairs. Um, and so I, I disagree that, that, that's, that you're losing something because I think you're enhancing the park quite a bit and you're taking away something that's not needed, kind of like the handball courts. We, we've done studies to see how often the handball courts get used and it's almost never. And so um, we're not really losing handball courts because no one uses them now. Thanks, Bruce. So sort of going back to that, um, I, I appreciate what your comments about the parking and I, I looked at the creek side and just counted really quickly on Google Maps and it has 40 stalls on theirs. Oh, okay. um, but again, uh, and I don't think actually that during the daytime besides when it's in school. I mean, obviously they don't want any school kids parking there, but I think it fills up just from park usage. I mean, I've been yeah. there several times where I see my long lost friend from wherever, you know, like it's a very popular well, and park. They're, they're still in the new phase. They, yes. They're not a year old yet. So yes. they opened last, late last fall, I think. And um, so you've still got a lot of people who, hey, let's go to that new park yes. that haven't ever been there before. And I think once that wears off, I think you'll find that, that 15 to 20 parking stalls will be sufficient for that park too. Okay. Because I'm was i a little bit concerned that we're going to run into the same problem. But I... I like the plan of making, like you said, of sloping that um, down to 7th East. My concern is, I know that there's lots of grass up on the third level. Is there grass, like tell me, it says sea planting plan, so it's kind of harder to sort of see exactly, but I, I think it's great that there's gonna be shrubs and stuff on that, um, on that slope. What about like, a bench for someone if they're walking up that slope and they want yeah. to rest so, so or what about something to utilize that area that's I know it's harder to utilize because of the slope but is there anything else we've looked at that we can do in you that bet. area no you're, you're right on target so if you look um, you can see the street level sidewalk and then you see the sidewalk that goes from that street level up the slope um, to the south and then you'll see there's a shortcut for someone who doesn't mind taking stairs. Uh, there's a straight shot from the street level up of, of stairs that will be, um, right now the idea is to make them uh, a little more rustic type stairs, maybe stone stairs, uh, not, uh, not concrete um, formal stairs. But there'll be stairs and then there's a circle that you see uh, once benches. you get to the top of the hill and there's two park benches there. And uh, that's kind of just a sitting area from that spot you can see over the top of the cemetery and, and see it. That's how it, I think the park probably got its name 40 years ago of Island View mm -hmm. Park is sitting there. Um, and then at the other levels, you can look out at the sunset and, and see the Island Loop Island and, and it's a, a great view spot. Um, so there's, there's two park benches there. I mentioned there's 11 other park benches throughout the playground and, and tennis court areas. So if you, as you look close, closer, um, you'll see um, there's a little mini, I think, in between on the mid-level playground, there's a, I think you see a circle that where there's a, a half circle. Um, it's at the top, top right hand of the screen. There's yeah. a little picnic table there with four benches connected to the table. I think there's a picture that you saw yeah. in the, so, and then there's um, uh, park benches I say, on each level. So uh, we have incorporated uh, lots of seating and, um, for moms or or people who are tired of chasing the, the kids uh, up and down the slopes to sit down and rest for a minute. What about on that? And I appreciate those seating areas. And I'm, it's looking like that circular area at the top of the stairs in the front with the two benches. That is all the same level as the Bowery and stuff, right? Right, right. But what about the actual slope, the slope slope? It'll all just be plantings. It's, it, um, it, it, there's, there's not much else. That, there, I mean, there, there will be some trees and shrubs. You saw kind of all the different plant lists of, of things. Some will be flowering, um, different colors of foliage. So it'll, it'll look attractive, but it's, it'll just be a slope. It won't. Uh, you're, you're wanting to do it in grass. It, it's, I'm not necessarily it's, it's saying a, grass because I don't oh. want it to come, you know, a sledding hill. But I. Well, so and, there's and a couple things that I'm thinking about. Um, 
a south south facing or sorry west facing hillside gets the heat of the hot afternoon yeah. sun it's tough to keep it green and it's uh dangerous to mow right and so for those reasons it's not grass I'm not, I, I'm not encouraging grass there. I don't want that to be misconstrued. So I'm just saying if there's maybe a bench that could go along those, that sidewalk oh. and or the fact that it's going to just be plantings without maybe like a, I don't know if there's a way that you could a like part, halfway a part through. A stopping area. Like a stopway. Yeah. Cause I, I sort of envision if I had, if I had a, some kids coming with me to the park and we're like, oh, let's walk up this thing. You might just see a bunch of kids messing up the plantings. They might just be like, oh, this is fun. I'm going to rummage through all of this stuff. So yeah. if there were a place where it's like, okay, we're going to stop here instead of, you know, I don't know. I'm just you, trying to think You of are much of nicer than me. I, I, I pick varieties that have thorns so that they won't rummage <laughs> through them. But that's a much nicer way to keep kids out of the shrubs than just to make a uh, resting point. That resting points for them rather than thorns on the shrubs. So uh, that, that's a great idea. We could certainly look at that if, if there's a, a landing or a, maybe a node that gets widened out to put a Maybe like a rate. node on one side of uh -huh. the of like the first part and then a node on the second side and maybe there's another bench and people, I mean, if people are really utilizing these, these all the way around system, it would be nice to have little private areas that are not just sitting areas that are yeah. by all of the kids but also just an area that could, they could sit and enjoy time and they don't have to be next to the kids or something. Excuse me. The elderly. Sure. We love those benches. You bet. On that top, the benches save us. That's the problem with us going to the community park. Need, yeah. Needs more benches. Now might be a good time yes. for our public hearing, if you'd like. I agree. Like. Yeah. Um, excellent comments. We'd love to hear them on the record. So. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant? Just one more brief one. Uh, Bruce, <clears throat> what can we learn from pavilion reservations? Does your office oversee those when people reserve pavilions for family gatherings or other celebrations? So the, so it's online, and the um, office here takes some of them in the office. People can come to City Hall and make a reservation, or they can make it online. And then we prepare for each of the reservations. We put up the reservation sign, we clean the bowery and the restroom, and make sure things are ready for it. We post the signs and empty, you know, empty the trash and things. So on, on this phase, we have the one pavilion. Did I hear you say there'd be six tables in that pavilion? Mm -hmm. And then uh, phase which, two. Which is downsized a little bit, actually. The current one uh, has up, has ha it's an octagon, and it has right. had up to eight, but usually seven, and we're, this one will just be a six table. Yeah. So, and then in the, the upper tier, which I guess is our anticipated phase two. There is yes. a small pavilion there as yes. well, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm just wondering what, if anything, we can extrapolate from current reservation uh, numbers, how often it's being reserved, whether or not we have too few pavilions. If we should look at providing another pavilion, if that would be something that's possible to accommodate, especially where you are making something that's going to be extremely tr attractive for families with young children. and. Uh, you're going to have more people showing up. Yeah, so um, th that's a great question. And more pavilions are always great, especially the smaller ones that aren't necessarily reserved, but just someone can show up to the park and there's a, a one or two table pavilion that they can just go and ha have a picnic at or something without having to make arrangements in advance and pay a fee. And um, th the original plan showed the current one um, that is there, that's a two table one, being relocated to the north end of the park. and. Um, then uh, the, the top one is, a, is a, will be a, a, an additional pavilion that could be reserved. It's big enough that we, we could reserve it. Um, we would like to add, add more. Another idea is, is you see the little area just to the north of the tennis courts. There's just an area there that right now is just grass, but we talked about, boy, that could be a, a, a little one table uh, pavilion, the shade shelter. Um, limiting factor is the budget. We, we just don't have the money for it, but those are all things that could be added as more wrap tax comes in or, or current, uh, more funding becomes available is adding additional pavilions. We just added a, a new pavilion to the community park that was a donation from the Tingi family. Uh, they donated $50,000 to the, the city and we built a six table pavilion um, on the um, southwest corner of the parking lot there. And we just had the ribbon cutting last Wednesday, a week ago tonight. And um, that, that 
park could use a couple more. Um, there could, we could put one um, over on the north side, but uh, the limit, reason why they aren't there already is just because of funding and prioritizing things. So we, we kind of got to do what we can do when we can do it, and so. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Just really quickly, sort of in, in relation to that, is there a reason why you're not keeping the existing um, pavilion and changing it to the square instead of keeping the existing one, just just because it's old and the, the, yeah. So the the wood is rotted and the the roof is deteriorated, okay. and and so um, and this this gives you this about the same amount of, of seating, but is a little more um, efficient. Okay. It shifted too, right, to allow for the parking to grow. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah the yeah. If you left the current one, it you that's right where the the south end of the parking lot is. Um, yeah. So the, the parking okay. will actually go yeah. up, up to the back edge, that south edge of where the current pavilion is now. Great. Um, but we, I, I, I forgot to mention the, the top one though, we, we feel like we can still save the, the, the frame yeah. and, and the, maybe the parks department as a, as a separate project might be able to install that uh, later on. That's not part of the phases and things like that, but we'll save the frame and see if later on we can do a cement pad and put, put that smaller pavilion somewhere else. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? If not, this matter has been scheduled for a public hearing, so we'll take the opportunity to open the public hearing and invite any member of the public who wishes to speak to the matter to step forward. And we'd love to hear um, from you, your ideas on benches. If you'll just step forward to one of the two mics and introduce yourself, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, I wish. So we have lovely recording equipment, which is why we were waiting to start our meeting until our little light went on. So for those who are watching at home, this helps them hear you. <laughs> I would have dressed up. I'm Bonnie Jensen. I'm, I've probably been longer at Island View Park than some of you have been on this earth. When I first moved here, Karen Duke and I would shovel the top area so we had a place to walk. Thank goodness, you, now that I'm so old I can't, they provide us with the sidewalks cleared. I go every day, every day to the top park. I love it. If you've ever wanted to see the ochres in January when the sun comes up, it's just gorgeous, and the Antelope Island. But I appreciate very much living in Centerville. We've been very interested in this park because there's 16 of us old people that walk up there every day. It's a privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much. And seeing no one else present, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Any further questions for staff? I just want the word old people to be amended to mature people. <laughs> <laughs> I will second that. I guess I have one last question for you, Bruce. Uh, if you'll, well, let's go ahead and invite the applicant Sorry. to step back. We I have, have so one, one last question for you. I don't, I'm not usually this annoying. Well, maybe I am, actually. <laughs> um, so the amount of stairs that, that are currently in Island View is a lot. I know that. And it's hard to get around that with the topography being as it is. So is there, like, with this new plan, are there fewer stairs up the, at, towards the south, or the west side? Are there, what's, can you tell me about the stairs yes. situation real quick? Uh, let's see. So um, on the ten, from the tennis court level, if you can show on the, the uh, phase one plan. So cur currently there's two staircases that go from the uh, Bowery parking area. There, there's two staircases that go up to the on tennis the courts. Side. There will just be one, you, as you can see in this plan. There'll just be one that goes right up through the middle of those tennis courts. Okay. Uh, but there's sidewalks on both sides now that you can um, go either direct towards the playground or you can go towards the, to the north and there's sidewalks that you'll be able to walk up to those other levels without taking stairs. So are those then, stairs on the... Right next to the and playground? Then, and uh, that little, those things? Nope. So those, those are, I think it's just indicating um, the, uh, uh, I'd have to look at that. Let's see. 
I think those are just indicating that that's a steeper area that where we had to put handrail. Um, if, if your slope is, yeah, if your slope is more than um, a certain amount, the ADA requires that you put a handrail along the edge of your slope. Um, and, and I could be wrong. Those might be, those might be some stairs over there towards the playground area that they would have had, that they put in because they had to for because of the, the steepness. They couldn't, couldn't make the slope uh, match. But, um, but to the north, there's no stairs. You can take that all, all the way without having to do stairs. And, and you're lose, so you're losing one staircase um, uh, to, on the north side of, of the um, parking lot that's currently right there. And then right now from the tennis courts up to the top level, there's two staircases and there will just be one staircase, that one central staircase. So you, so you are losing some stairs. So to go around ADA or stroller or whatever, you start at the bottom, go up that angle, then you go around and then you go North. sort of parallel to the right. tennis and then you go up and So switch. yeah, so that, that's, that's the phase one plan. If you shift to the phase uh, two plan, Okay. But then where do you go from there to get? Yeah, there's up the, up, right up the sloped hill um, all along on an angle all the way over to um, what you see picks up here that comes over to the playgrounds area. That, the reason why that uh, sidewalk is so curved and arched is because you're picking up some of that slope um, and it goes all the way down to the north side and connects to the sidewalk on the north side. Sorry, that one. There, there you go. Uh, so, so, so go, no, no, go down again. Go down again. See, see, uh, see the in, in the red. Yeah. In the red, that's the connecting sidewalk you're you're looking for. Okay, so right there. So, right, right. So, see how that goes around Perfect. the tennis court. Yep. Uh -huh, and goes on up to the okay. to the playground area, and then and then connects with the top level sidewalk, which will go around the top level pavilion and make that loop, that existing loop that's there now, will continue to be there. So that corner gets changed a little bit in order to make all of the sidewalks connect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, any, I think, I think you're off the hook for now, unless anyone else has any questions for the applicant. Any further discussion or debate questions for staff? Just one quick comment. Um, this seems to clearly, uh, this is an administrative decision on the ordinances that we have that regulate the zone. Mm -hmm. I appreciate Bruce letting us <laughs> help design the park, but it seems as though our, our decision here is, is much more relegated to some of the items that Corey outlined in the staff report. Yeah, we, we appreciate you for indulging us, Bruce, because this is the first time that this one has been in front of us, so we're yeah. very excited about it. Say, I, we built Freedom Hills Park and Corey Walton Park. We remodeled. Uh, Do you want to just step to the yeah. mic for me? Just, We've done some brand new parks, built new parks in my tenure, and also remodeled parks. And this is my first time ever coming to the Planning Commission. So I don't know if, if we just, if, if maybe Kevin Campbell's come in my place. Maybe that's the, maybe the engineers have come in my place. But this is my first time coming to the Planning Commission, uh, even though I've been involved in, in quite a few uh, remodels and expansion, the community park expansion and those kinds of things. You drew the short straw, huh? I, <laughs> I guess. So, so I know we're, we're planning, I, I have another site plan amendment application on my desk for uh, possible futsal courts at the community park that I'll be coming back to you with those. That, that'll be funded through uh, RSL. Their, their professional women's soccer team is the theme they want to give it, so. Cool. Thank you so much. All right, any further discussion or debate? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. I hereby make a motion for the Planning Commission to accept the conceptual site plan for the Island View Park renovation and provide the following directives, one through eight, and reasons for action A and B. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion or debate? Kevin, we're going to go with you last this time, so let's start on my right with Commissioner Workman. Aye. 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 And Aye. There we go. Um, thank you so much. The motion passes. Okay, moving right along to item number three <coughs> on our agenda. We're being asked to consider the proposed amendments to CZC 12.32 residential zones to address changes to the accessory building setbacks in all residential zones. And I'll turn the time back over to staff. 
Thank you, Chair Heyman, members of the commission. This is a council-sponsored change. Uh, in one of their recent open sessions, they had a few individuals come and ask for consideration of loosening or relaxing the accessory building standards in our residential zones, which is different than the agricultural. We do have some residential and agriculture. This one is just the uh, residential low, medium, and high zones. Um, I don't, some of you, it's been a little while, it's been what, a, maybe a year and a half? Two years ago, uh, there was a sponsor to change this. I think the council sponsored some change in relation to a, a, an accessory building in an agricultural zone adjacent to, access, to a lot in the residential zone. They felt it was too high and cumbersome and so forth. So we went through an analysis um, about accessory buildings and setbacks in the backyard and I made a lengthy presentation to the council and I did not win my argument back then. And, uh, and I think uh, some of my argument, just to kind of feed my own ego a little bit, has come to fruition. People are struggling with how aggressive the accessory building setbacks are. And so just to kind of explain, the, the, the standard is split in three ways under the current ordinance, and you see what they would like to change. Our, just a way of setting, the zoning code allows accessory buildings in the rear yard areas as long as you're six feet away from the, the rear of the home. At that point, um, there are some building codes that come into play versus the setbacks. Uh, over time, setbacks have ranged from one foot to today, sometimes to eight feet. Uh, generally, originally, before this amendment, we had a three foot and a five foot setback. Um, the, the three and the five foot setback were two different codes. The zoning ordinance lets you, back then, let you go to three feet. The building code said you could go to three feet, but you have to put in a one hour firewall because any, the building code is trying to create 10 foot separations on adjacent lots between structures. So if you, did a, if you did something less than five feet, you were supposed to put in a one hour firewall. What's interesting is tough sheds escape that building code horizon regularly because tough sheds are less than the 200 square feet requirement of a building permit. And so tough sheds regularly get placed right against the property line, don't go through a permitting system, but technically under the International Residential Code, they, they're, they're still regulated. So we just have that gap uh, in, in, a, in a permit situation. But if you, if you did it all right, zoning code lets you go at three feet. Building code would then step in and say you're less than five feet, put in the one hour firewall. Um, and so you had the, the two standards. The, the current standard that was adopted in response to um, the complaints about a, an accessory building in the agricultural zone was what we split out in three ways. We did the accessory building uh, less than 200 square feet because that's the building code threshold. So that's your tough shed example. That was uh, put at allowable at three feet. If your building exceeded 200 square feet or greater, it was moved to the fire code or the building code addressing the firewall issue at five feet. And then we had the example response is what if I have a tall and large building? And that was moved that if you are two story or greater than 10 feet in height. And what's important in the component of the 10 feet in height is we use the building code <coughs> standard of what 10 feet means. 10 feet means you take the distance between the lowest eave and the highest peak and hit the midpoint. And then from final grade to the midpoint, that's how you would measure 10 feet. And that's our height uh, measurement. And they moved, I mean, 10 feet's not very tall. I mean, you can get eight to nine feet before you get to a plate. And part of the argument of accessory buildings is if you're using a tough shed, it's going to be very short. If you're using it in a garage, it's probably going to be tall, depending on whether you do a 312, 412, or match your house at 1212 if you have such a steep roof. Um, and so they just said, no, we're going to go 10 feet in height uh, or two-story. If you exceed the 10 feet or you're a two-story structure, which is feasible under the, under the code, you're moving to the eight-foot setback. Eight-foot setback matches the minimum side yard setback of a home. 
in our residential zones, we have a minimum of eight. The counterbalance on the other side of the home would be 10. You can split it nine and nine, but you can't reduce it less than, than eight. So you have to total 18. Uh, that received complaints and, and a pushback um, is as people want to maybe look at a larger accessory <laughs> building, but they're still in a residential low zone on a quarter acre lot, moving, you know, running a, a driveway down the side of your home, then you have to move the building eight feet over off the property line. And depending on the depth of your lot, if it's a short lot, moving it over makes it difficult to move cars in and out. And to get that, it's a wind? It's the HVAC system. Oh, oh, I was ready for the alien abduction. <laughs> I was like, okay, I know I, people want to get rid of me, but I didn't know they sent the aliens to come get me. Take me away, haha. <laughs> Um, I'm lost. That one distracted me. <laughs> Back to if it was too short, of, if you had a longer lot, you could put it quite, quite a distance. It just adds that much more driveway and concrete to, to get to your garage. And, and that was a complaint that some individuals brought. So this table here shows you, I believe, the motion of the city council. Uh, they wanted to relax the standard, but not too much. And so the way they relaxed it is they bumped accessory buildings regulations from the building code, the permit level of 200 square feet to 500 square feet. Um, I struggle with that a little bit because you've got different codes you're dealing with and it's always easier to try to be consistent and explain folks. 200 feet, you don't need 200 feet or less, you don't need a permit to get under the building code. But now we're moving to 500 square feet, which you do have to get a permit to the building code. Um, and, and so tough sheds at three feet, five, 200 to, to 500 square feet or, lar or 500 square feet larger, three feet still, but you have to get a permit. And you can see kind of the communication to the public and, and, and keeping it simple. I mean, the. The, the practice of land use planning is getting more and more in the practice of keep it simple and clear because if it's ambiguous, it falls in favor of the property owner now under state law. So the more ambiguous your code gets, the more the, the favoritism. So if you're going to regulate, regulate and keep it clear. So they wanted to bump it to 500 square feet. Accessory buildings 500 square feet or greater. Go to the five feet. And then accessory buildings two story or greater. And this number was in flux, 15, 14, 15, 14, landed at 14. So they're still saying, hey, if you're two-story or greater uh, and you have this height differentiation to 14 feet now, now you move to the eight feet. Um, so I, I, I struggle from a process standpoint, code standpoint, and for lack of better terms, traditional expectations of zoning in backyard areas. You know, the, the idea of having a setback of some type is twofold. One, you don't want people running all of their snow in their roof flying off on the property line onto the adjacent neighbors. So you usually bump it back. The building code is a safety code. It wants five feet to deal with it. A lot of people do not like to construct the one hour firewall. And in simplistic terms, in traditional wood framing, it would just be sheetrock on both sides of your two by four stud and then put your vapor barrier in your siding on. Brick, a cement block, all of those other kind of things uh, can be fire rated too. But you think of a tough shed, I mean, who wants to put sheetrock on both sides and try to expose the, the exterior to any moisture so they don't like doing it. So my world is simple, five feet satisfies the fire code, gets the buildings off of the property line, and tough sheds are just that perpetual place of limbo that, that will probably never be solved because the building code doesn't require a permit. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the five feet. Um, garages, uh, we have a lot of accessory buildings out there. I think in the presentation, I just picked 10 examples at random on the aerial photo. This, the aggressive part of the code renders a lot of accessory structures non-conforming. We have 
pool coverings and all kinds of larger buildings, less than the eight foot setback in a lot of the rear yards. I understand the privacy issue. People are worried about windows and, and looking into their backyard or looking into their home. But we have those privacy issues when you have a differentiation in slope, somebody's backyard to somebody's backyard. You can still look down into the party, what's going on, and get jealous that you weren't invited. Um, <coughs> but so, and the other, the other traditional thing for me is, is and it's kind of a Western culture and it adds in Utah being in the West. The backyard, you know, I'm fine with you giving me a front setback. I'm fine with you doing some design standards for homes so that we have consistency in the neighborhood and, and protect those values. But other than the inside of my home, leave me alone in my backyard. And yet we still do regulate some degree and that balance between letting people have their backyard space. And I would not want a building sitting in the middle of my backyard on a small lot. I like to move the buildings closer to the sides, have more space for the patio and gathering areas or a pool or a gazebo, uh, trying to serpentine into that uh, building is odd to me. So I'm making my arguments even against the council's wants here. Um, one last time, see if I get anywhere. Uh, and then you have this spacing requirement. Um, if, you, if, you, if, if you go large to eight feet, is that sufficient to now pour a pad and put a boat in? Does that become the place that's too tight for boats and RVs, a little too tight? So now these where I still where I put the wheelbarrow and I put all of my junk and my extra wood and all the things stacking up against the property line and now that makes my neighbor mad. And so if you reduce if you if you reduce the setback so that that there's not a lot of junk use to it, but they're not trying to make it something that it's not, you, you kind of balance what's going on to the side. They'll put some gravel in, try to keep it a little bit weed down and you might see a ladder slid down the side of, of the accessory building and so forth. So I'm, I'm kind of the five foot person. Um, I did not put that in your report. I just wanted to verbally argue that again. I, I think five feet is sufficient to, to, it's a safety issue and it handles a drainage issue. Uh, so I like the five foot <coughs> setback and let people, I mean, we have a maximum 20 foot for the, for the accessory building. If you're using it as just a tough shed or something like that, you'll stay into it. The other issue is if you're trying to use it for RV parking and so forth, have you seen the sizes of, of, your, of your trailers with the air conditioning on top? I mean, your top plate single story has got to get 15 feet or higher. Um, and so now you are taking that building that somebody wants to store some RV in or a boat in instead of parking it out front all year long and you're shifting the building into the middle of the lot because by the time you do a two car garage uh, with a height that can accommodate a trailer and RV with just a three or four twelve pitch, you know, you're, you're, so 14 for me is just a shot in the dark. It's, it's, I'm comfortable with a large building being at five feet in the separation, but others are not. That's why we had to complain. So that's my pitch and soapbox, if it makes any sense. So I just acquiesced and, and uh, I thought I changed it a little bit. I gave you the two options. Going with the council, knowing that in my mind, the argument of practicality will not survive, um, I don't think we should change it to 500. We should keep the 200 stuff in place, just consistent with the building code and the permit system. Go with the third option, um, move, move it to anything that's two story or greater than 14 feet, move to the eight feet. And, but I did give you a motion that matches the city council's amendment. So a lot of muddiness, please ask me the questions because I got lost with the HVAC system. Thank you, Corey. Question for you. So will you remind me what the, what it used to be like? So before we changed Anything. this, what, two years ago, 18 months ago, compare what this proposal is versus what it used to be. Used to be three feet. 
and if you went to three feet and you had a large structure, you, you, you put in the one hour firewall. So most people would just bump it to five if it was a large structure. I see. So they so, wouldn't have to put in the one hour firewall. Okay. So zoning code was three feet for all of them. Fire code, not fire, building code that addresses some fire issues stepped in. Okay, you can go to three feet. Zoning lets you do it. Put in the one hour firewall. Folks said, I don't want to put in a one hour firewall. They would bump it to the building code limit of five feet. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? All right. Um, this one, the applicant is um, Center of City. <coughs> Seeing mm -hmm. no one here. And Just I probably didn't do a good argument for the councils. <laughs> <laughs> so at least give them measure that they want to be this restrictive, but loosen it up a little bit. All right, well, it is scheduled for a public hearing, so we'll go ahead and take the opportunity to open the public hearing, invite any member of the public who wishes to speak to step forward. Seeing no one here, we'll close the public hearing. Um, Chair Raymond, I think Lisa yes. called me earlier with a, a note that we might want to include that's not in the staff report. Uh, actually, I've thought better of that. I, my suggestion was perhaps to add a footnote because we already have a footnote about how the setback is measured so my comment was do we want also want to add a footnote about how the height is measured because in the third line of the city council's option or your option it says accessory building paren two-story or greater than 14 feet in height um, but if we're talking about the maximum height we all know we go to the midpoint it's not that clear in our code that we go to the midpoint. But so my question was, is it if you're over 14 feet actual or if you're over 14 feet as measured to the midpoint, like we usually measure maximum height. Right. Um, but I don't we actually I, I guess we don't put elsewhere in our code as measured to the midpoint. So I'm hesitant to put it in one place when we don't put it yeah, everywhere the, else. The current code standard, this would be a different section. It would be in your supplementary development standard section as it measures building height. And it states building height as measured or as set by the city zoning ordinance or the building code, whichever is adopted. We've adopted the building code, so we use the building codes measurement. Yeah, so so I, you, you have to go to the building code to find midpoint definition. I think it's a bigger issue, and I don't, I'm not sure I want to raise that. We'll solve that later. Mm -hmm. But it could be argued either way, because mm -hmm. we're not saying, usually when we say maximum height, we know we go to that. But I, I guess any time we say height, I don't, I don't know. Right. Okay, a couple of questions for you, because I... Sure, I expected. I'm going to blame it on the fact that my voice is going out, that my brain is thinking slowly here. So let me make sure that I'm understanding. Um, so your proposal differs from what the city council has proposed in as much as you would keep the less than 200 square feet the same on both of these first two categories. You wouldn't Correct. mess with that at all. Correct. And the only change that you would be making is to the two stories or greater than 14 feet in height. However, it is that we determine Correct. what height is. Okay, so if I go with the city council's requested change, okay, so 500 square feet, so I'm now two and a half times bigger than my tough shed. And I, as long as I stay at 500 square feet or less, then I can stick my extra large tough shed up within three feet of my property line. And Correct. The, and the fire codes at that point don't kick in and require They would the one still, because it's over fire. the 200, yeah. So they'd still kick in. <coughs> so you could go to three feet, but you still have to put the one then on the firewall. I have to still put my one out. So, so 500 square feet, less than 500 square feet gets to go to three feet. Okay, but then I have to stick in my firewall, and the alternative for me, if I don't want to stick bump in my firewall, is I bump it back to back five, to five. Feet, which is effectively right where we were before. Right. That's why I like the five feet. Just five feet. And then you Everything. like the five feet for the fourteen foot height. Yeah, I'm I'm comfortable because because zoning code it lets you thirty five foot home measured midpoint, and lets you have accessory building at twenty feet measured at midpoint. 
where you get the extra is 20 feet as somebody the, the the problem issue that you know the 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 bad app on the barrel was somebody had attic space built the trusses to be able to utilize that attic space for storage and put a window in for light and ventilation to that attic space the complaint was is well now they can see into my bedroom window that that was 14 feet to the property line plus 20 feet to the next home which is 34 feet away but two homes can be 20 foot setbacks and be only 40 feet so to me the privacy issue was irrelevant in in my view because just differing topography created the same event so we are trying to address <coughs> somebody's concern about privacy when there were four other code scenarios that accomplished the same thing so why were we so overzealous over one when it was possible to create the same situation in other areas and we're not doing code to address it i mean how how uh, differing topography do you change the setbacks of the home from each other so if you're above a person instead of having a 20-foot setback now you have to have a 40-foot setback you can see where it starts getting messy to to regulate concerns of privacy Corey I remember um, probably I don't know five years ago now there was an issue of someone building um, an accessory building that was causing some significant shadowing shading on the property the adjacent property and they were concerned that they couldn't grow their crops or something right is this I mean do you feel like what are your thoughts on that um, you, you can have that I mean that's why you have accessory buildings but you can ha you, you have that a little bit uh, from side to lot line to side lot line depending on the orientation if you think about it your maximum distance between for this is the air and light the typical zoning I'm regulating air giving air and light to the lots they're only 16 feet away oriented east west you're gonna have shadowing into the side yard area snow removal and all those other things occur so you're already creating some of that problem with structures to begin with does a 20-foot structure add to that problem <coughs> to some degree it does but set that aside we don't regulate the planting of trees I have a garden that two trees to my neighbor went bust with disease and I was they cut them down and I was so excited I got another two hours of sunlight in my garden and then they replaced it one of them with another tree it's not mature yet but so now do you know do we get into that argument and say okay we regulate buildings but we don't regulate trees they can put trees up block the sunlight anyway are we really gaining an advantage right and and how how much of of that are air and light are we trying to protect regulate you know in a regulation between homes we don't allow accessory structures but between the backyards yeah you'll your neighbor plants a tree it impacts you you build a 20-foot shed it impacts you put chickens in your backyard it impacts you Put a barking dog in your backyard it impacts you okay okay make sure that i understand this correctly if you don't mind so under our existing code if i want to put in a 400 foot or a 400 square foot accessory building let's call it an extra large tough shed 400 square feet right now i come in and automatically i'm going five feet correct so I'm automatically so you're in that middle you're in that middle yes. tier now so i'm automatically complying with the fire code mm -hmm. i don't have the option of going three feet i don't I, I guess i could put in a firewall if if i want one but i don't really need to because i'm automatically set at five feet correct. and i'm off to the races correct so it's pretty straightforward when i open the code i know exactly what it is that i have to do mm -hmm. and done under the city council's regulation i have a 400 square foot accessory building I open up the code and I say, great, I get to put this thing three feet away from my property. So I start planning for it. I lay it all out. I get the drawings. Plan come review in, comes in. I come in and I say, great. Zoning signs have, off because it's three feet. I Building three official feet. reviews it I'm and three says. three feet, yep, I'm three feet away. And then all of a sudden firewall. I'm told, wait, hold on. You have to put in a firewall. Hmm. Wait a second, firewall? What are you talking about? I'm, I'm within the code. No, no, there's this other building code that you weren't taking into account. And so you either have to put in a firewall or you have to move it back five feet. So as I see the, as I see the debate on this one, it's the old way is very clear. 
there's clarity there. People know exactly what it is that is going to be required because the code and the fire, the building code and the fire code are going to be in sync. Okay? Generally, that's why but I like the five feet. The, the benefit that we get out of the city council's view is that I have, it's, it, it's more complicated and it does have the risk of creating some confusion as between the difference between the building code and the fire code. The benefit that I get as an owner is that I now have the option to either put it five feet from my property line or to put it three feet and install the, the firewall. And I get to choose which one makes more sense for my project. True. Shaylin, settle it. You just argue both sides. Where are you going to land? I don't know. <laughs> I got to know. But I just wanted to make sure I had in my mind what the benefits and the drawbacks were on both sides because I think that there are I think that there are positive <laughs> arguments on one side. I think that clarity of code, I mean, I think you make a good point, Corey, that we want to try to make our codes clear for people. And I, I think that we need to try to avoid creating frustration. But on the other side, if don't we also want to give our property owners the freedom to, if, if they want to go the extra steps, and pay the extra money so that they can put their <coughs> property, you know, a little closer to their fence line. I, I think I am inclined to go the latter option. It, those are the weighty matters of debate. Mm -hmm. but it's I a know. preferential thing rather than a, this is right and this is wrong. I, I could, I'm really, this is going to be ironic, I am really on the fence. <laughs> About three feet either way. Are you three feet or five <laughs> feet? Three feet or five feet? <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to hear other thoughts on this one. Any other thoughts? Well, for me, you know, if it was my backyard, I would want to be able to be three feet off the fence line if possible. But if I'm the neighbor, I would want their building to be five feet away. So it's, mm -hmm. it's tough. So I don't know. It's hard. You, you sometimes are getting smaller and smaller lots as time goes on. And then, you yes. know, it's 20,000 square foot lot, an extra two feet isn't a big deal. But if you're in an 8,000 square foot lot or 7,000 square foot lot, it's a big deal. You already got your house in there, two feet might make all the difference to your layout. It's the third tier that's really constraining. If the you 14. want a little extra big space in your headroom, you got to sit it in the back of your house or in the center of your lot. There, you know, yep. speaking if if you have a really small lot and you have to move it to eight feet. Well, I, I agree. I think, you know, just lots are getting smaller and smaller as, as population grows. And so I think we, we're going to need to allow for that a little bit narrow of a, of a setback, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, make sure it still meets building code, but I, I agree. Is there a way that we could notify people? Because my concern with making two inconsistent codes, the building code and the fire code, is that I would be concerned if people are surprised, right? They invest a lot of time and money in putting something together, and then they find out that they can't do it as planned or that it's going to be more expensive than it's planned. And it seems to me like that concern can be addressed through educating the public, be it through the website or be it through you know, some, some other communication process so that people are very clear and not surprised. Yeah, I mean, you know, my experience is, you know, cities vary. One foot to five feet is pretty normal code elements. And there are some that get caught in that three to five with the firewall issue. And most often, all of them just say, I'm moving it to five, I would say predominantly. The eight foot issue is what's generating the resistance to, to, to what's going on. Because people have come in over time since the adoption and I probably had maybe, if I were to count, five people just walk away from their accessory building because they were not going to put it at eight feet. Each time the conversation was, well, I agree with you, you might want to talk to your elected official. We now had somebody finally do it and I think it were three or four people came up and were more worried about this eight foot than they were the, the five and the three issue. Uh, getting it out to the public at this point in time, uh, you know, I don't know what the, what, what individuals, I mean, you, ha you make the argument of the flexibility. 
Um, you know, to me, to me, the you just put everything back to the three feet, and uh, and uh, they bump it back to five feet if they want to do the fire code. It's that third tier, and it's that third tier of eight feet that's those taller buildings that the council's responding to. So, well, you could perhaps just add a footnote. That, that's what you I know, was actually non ask. Non-binding, but just say note. Buildings over 200 square feet yeah. require building code requirements, you know, which may also include a firewall. Um, because if, if we put it on our website and things like that, I mean, yeah. it, it falls through the cracks. Yeah. You've got to put it where they're going to be looking. It's, it's kind of like fences. I mean, people actually don't have to get permits for fences, so they're not going to go to our website anyway. Right. I was going to suggest that if that was possible to put a footnote or I mean you don't want to have to keep it. up with the building code so you'd want it to be very vague That's you right. know but just more of a notice that we want to give you that extra two feet but yeah. no if you building put codes may still apply yeah, yeah if you put something bigger that's what that footnote is trying to help people plus Corey's super familiar with this so every time someone comes in he's go through the routine call. discussion every time yeah. But yeah, I think you've just put in there the other footnote is that uh, building codes may. Now, on still these, apply. so do they require any kind of permit from zoning? Accessory? Mm -hmm. It goes through the permitted, re uh, permitted use review with the building permit. So <coughs> zoning, zoning looks at it a lot. But just, it's not a zoning permit, it's a building no, permit. It's, it's, and so it would have to be over 200 square feet. Yeah. The tough shed escapes. That's always the no man's land or no. So there is land. that trigger um, where they're not just looking at the code because they, they now have to apply. If it's over oh. 200 square feet, they will have to apply for a building. Permit. Right. So we've had a lot of discussion on the one story mm -hmm. issue, but not a lot of discussion on the accessory building two story or greater, bumping it from 10 to 14. Um, I mean, except for, and I, I think Becky makes a good point, because I do remember when we talked about this issue, uh, whenever it was last before us, there was some concern about the reason that we wanted to push the larger buildings back farther from the lot line was to prevent that shade issue, the, the issue of having some very large building looming into the neighbor's yard. I'm... I'm surprised, I guess, that the city council wants to make it 14 feet instead of the 10. They want to make it taller, right? Yeah, allow yeah. it to be taller, four feet taller before at. So if, you, if you're less than the 14 feet. And they're doing that to address the concern that was brought before right. them. So they got a bunch of people that say, I got a 12 or 13 foot building that I want to put in. I, actually, I think the individuals coming, the 14 is not going to solve their problem. Oh, they're going to need 15 anyway. Is it, uh, remind me, this, is, this would be measured to the midpoint. 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 I mean, I, I'm like Thomas, you know, if, if someone's putting a two story accessory building, if a neighbor of mine is putting a two story accessory building, up i want it as far away as possible from mine um but i i guess if it's your yard, you if, it's your, if it's your yard i don't know like how well no wait the way that it's drafted it's this is an or statement so if it's two stories it has to be eight feet back right right so automatically this so this is this this change is dealing with one story buildings that are in excess of 14. Yeah, 14 feet. Which, why would you build something at 14 feet? You want it higher if you're doing that. Oh, so you think these people have two story things? No, I have one story shops and they want to store their trailer in there. Oh, but the boat. How do you get a trailer in with a, so a 14 foot plate? Mm -hmm. Well, it won't be a 14 foot plate, but. The midpoint will be. 14. <coughs> So Corey, you're saying higher. we should bump that to 17 feet? Is that what you're suggesting? I just think we should get rid of it. But, but you're, you, know, I mean, you have a 20-foot limit to height, but a person can receive a CUP to go higher from the Planning Commission. So wait, if it were only Corey's world, you would just leave it at 5 feet across the board, up get rid of feet. up to 20 feet? Get yeah, I mean, I could be talked feet. into less than 200 at 3 feet, but... But yeah, five foot is justifiable. 
you know, from my point of view, is code creation and justifiable. Okay. Five feet, plenty justifiable. Beyond that is starting to go into the preference issue, and now you have to make the arguments to justify the aesthetic. What aesthetic, you know, light and air and privacy, and those are the weaker links in case law. We're allowed to, we're allowed to regulate aesthetics. General welfare is the concern. How far do you go with that general welfare yeah. clause? So, Corey, hypothetical here. On average, an RV is about, you said... I think you need 15-foot top plate just to get an RV in. Now that's going to be difficult given but the height restriction. But if anyone has, like, an RV pad, they're parking an RV... On the side yard, you can park right an RV Right next in. to... Or the backyard. Or the backyard, right next to anyone... So if you have like an accessory building, you're trying to cover that RV so that it's not such a nu nuisance to the neighborhood and the visual aesthetic and everything. So the idea is, well, I create an accessory building and then the RV can go in that. It's better for the RV and it's less of an unsightly thing, ho hopefully for the neighborhood. <coughs> but that would have to be higher than the 14 feet Most midpoint. Likely. It depends on how they construct that garage because usually if it's like a two car, they'll do a 312 or 412 pitch, uh, fa you know, fairly shallowly. In Utah, we don't do flat roofs or if you do it, you learn why. Um, and then you'll have one door that's large for the, for the uh, recreational vehicle and you have one door that's for regular height for a car or something else. Well, what a pickle, huh? <laughs> Kevin, you've been pretty quiet. Any thoughts? Kevin's one of those applicants that are... Yeah. What was the heck? Nothing. Go ahead, Kev. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I've just been sitting here thinking and listening. Um, I, I kind of struggle with this one as well. Uh, it feels like this... This issue keeps coming back and keeps coming back, and um, honestly, part of me thinks that we should just leave well enough alone. Um, it it is what it is. It works for almost everybody. There's a handful of people that it doesn't work for, but you know, there's always going to be a handful of people that are unhappy about something or another. Um, the other thing to think about too, I mean, it doesn't matter what we recommend, really. <laughs> Kevin, you trying to say you want that half an hour of your life back? Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I actually kind of like Lisa's idea of throwing a little note on there or something. If we if we go that way, you know, that way we can open it up, be a little bit more permissive, but try and be really clear about, hey, this is what's going to happen with this. Besides. Um, there's probably a whole bunch of illicit accessory buildings all around the city anyway. So, you know, how much of, who are we really affecting? We're affecting the people who try and do it the right way and not those people who just do it anyway, you know. <coughs> so that's, that's all I got. Man, I'd, I'd be inclined to send up to city council Corey's dream, dream one. Say five feet, Everything. set back to 20 feet, and allow under 200 to go to three if they want to bite that If you need off. to go higher, you come in for a CUP. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. I feel like it's simple. I feel like it gives people options. It's not restrictive on their property rights. And I feel like it makes the most sense. I think it's good planning. I think it's clean, and it's clear, and it's uh, expansive. And I think uh, as our job as planning commissioners, that's what I'd recommend setting up. And just as a note, according to Google, most uh, RV garage doors, this is just the door height, are 12 to 16 feet in height. So, you, yeah, you're not going to solve the problem here. Not at 14. So, do you feel like less than the 200 square feet for the one story is more restrictive than the 500, or do you just like that one better because it coordinates with the building code? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Say that again. <laughs> Do you like the, I mean, I've heard the 200 square feet from Corey and from you guys both 
saying, you know, keeping it at the less than the 200 square feet. Do you like the 200 square feet just simply because it coordinates with the building code or do you think that it's better to just have a smaller accessory building closer? Because I'm fine with the 500 square feet accessory building being three feet away from the property line. I feel like the 200 square foot accessory building, it just means that we're just being more restrictive right there. And so I'm wondering, are you leaning towards the 200 because it's coordinating or because you like to be a little bit more restrictive or a little more cautious on the size of the accessory building? I'd be fine with 500. I'd be okay bumping it to 500. You know, think, think about what the size of 500 is. It's big. 10 by 50. It's a big, big building. That's very narrow, but just think 10 by 50 to get the scale in your mind. It's a big building. So if so someone... Are you, sorry, are you, so, so when you're making the argument, you want to keep the neighbor far away. 500 square feet is sizable. Well, and so then my question is, Corey, so if someone has something over, you know, over than a 200 and they want to get, they, can, they can't get anywhere close, there's not, not that second option that Shailene was talking about for them to have the three feet. So if I have a 250 square foot shed right it a tiny bit bigger five, than a tough shed five feet yeah i'm i'm automatically forced to go five feet mm -hmm. the, building the code requires you a firewall yeah i mean 500 is a big a big amount of space i'm just trying to in my mind kind of figure out keeping it clean with the building code or allowing people a little bit more flexibility in accessory building size I mean, there's another parameter in just so you know, I mean, not trying to throw a wrench into it, but if, if you have a very small lot, you've occupied your build area for your home, just as in theory, uh, so it'd be about a 6,000 square foot lot under a code, you can only cover 20% of your, your yard with, a, with any, of, any and all accessory buildings, so that would drive a large building down, down. substantially. Okay, so of all the wrenches you've thrown in, just <laughs> summarize and tell me which which option you think is best. I like the old way, three and five feet. I like the three feet, and then they can just bump it to the five feet. But 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 my original recommendation was is the five and the three at the 200, 200 is the break point. And then after that, you're five feet away because you're only gaining three feet for the eight feet, and that's where your house is. And your house is big. Your house is at eight feet. Yeah. At 35. And at 35. Yeah. So to me, break point's 200. Three feet, five feet, done. I like the five feet for the two story. I've kind of been leaning towards that, but I'm still hung up on, I think 200 is not very big. Like, I don't feel like that's a very big building. 10 by 20. 10 by 20. How big is, I mean, I'm trying to figure that out. My first apartment was 180 square feet, guys. So it was little, but. That's called a studio. It was tiny. It was bitty. The first closet. Yeah. First closet. We call it the closet, affectionately the closet, actually. Corey, this, <clears throat> this has come to us from the city council under the auspices of citizens who've made complaints. Um, are you aware of any themes um, any kind of commonality of those complaints where there were certain types of uses they were looking to accomplish? Uh, I, I wouldn't say common. Um, you know, w most of the time it's some type of uh, garage or some type of they're trying to do a garage slash workshop. Uh, those are the two most common things that you can see into it. Um, you do see out there when you have the larger lots and space available, the third type of accessory building that's common in Centerville is the shy of a guest house so that they, they can park their toys in it. Uh, it can be a garage. It can have a portion of a workshop, but they will put a bedroom, a bathroom, <laughs> and, and what constitutes a dwelling or a guest house is kitchen, bed, a sleeping area, and a bathroom. So they'll forego the uh, kitchen because we don't regulate microwaves and hot plates as part of a kitchen. 
And so they'll provide an area where the hot plates and the toaster oven and things of that nature can go in there. And then they'll provide a, a bedroom and uh, a bathroom. And that becomes their garage slash workshop and family coming for extended stay. That was kind of my, my other thing I was kind of thinking about. If, if long term we're trying to push towards infill or trying to push towards, I mean, long term, not with the current city council, obviously, I think they're against the ADU option. But if we as a city are hoping to address moderate income housing and we're trying to figure out what are some tools we can use and ADU happens to be one that the city council eventually does like you know how how is this setback does this setback does the setback affect potential infill or potential adu usage well i've got to go back to my earlier argument do you want to put that use garage or adu in the middle of your backyard if you have a small lot so but, or do you want to push it to the sides so i think that the 20 percent rule might change the analysis or it might um, be worth thinking through that a little bit on how when you have a smaller lot I think does that not effectively the difference between three and five feet on a smaller lot push that dramatically further into the lot when you have a smaller lot and does a smaller lot in the 20% rule not kind of auto regulate some of these issues anyway yeah. I mean someone with a smaller lot is not going to be able to build a you know the size of shed that the ordinance may accommodate just because they don't have the space to do it and the 20% rule would limit them. And so in that respect, I'm looking at this from an angle that maybe it would make sense to, be, to allow residents and with uh, uh, Lisa Romney's suggestion that we drop the footnote, then it would add the flexibility for folks with the smaller lots to put a shed in uh, that would accommodate their use, but not you know, have them serpentining into this shed that's in the middle of their smaller yard. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 the flexibility they could. I mean, we see bump it up to five hundred. Uh, you know, uh, my son lives in an apartment that's six hundred and seventy-five square feet, so that's it was plenty of large. So if you did an ADU uh, and did the firewall, you could bump it to you know five hundred square feet would get you an ADU. Put in the firewall, get you to the three feet. That's the argument that sh the chair was making. And the, for a small lot, that could be nice. Yeah, when we keep focusing on 500, and I think that that was just an arbitrary number that you picked, mm -hmm. right? So if we're concerned Somebody that, picked. If, well, if, so if we're concerned that 500 square feet is a pretty big building, I mean, we could look at making some change there and set it yeah. at 400 or yeah. something, something to that effect. I want to go back to this to this last piece, the, the eight foot piece, and I know that we moved this back. My, my brain is rethinking this. So if I am building a house on an empty lot and I have to have my eight foot minimum setbacks, remind me, what is the tallest house that I can build on that eight foot setback? 35 feet, That's midpoint. That's what I thought. So I'm, I'm almost persuaded, Logan. I mean, I know that we were very concerned about casting shadows and there were concerns about that the last go around but I find myself thinking how is it how can I how can I reconcile the fact that I can build a 35 foot house eight foot for eight feet from my property line but I can't build taller than a 10 or 14 or whatever any closer arbitrary number that we pick any closer I, I'm not quite sure that I can reconcile that so when you propose making you know a, if it's 200 feet or less put a three foot setback anything between 200 square feet and up to 20 feet in height five foot setbacks call it good to go and then anything above a 20 foot tall get a cup to, to me that's starting to sound like a really reasonable approach and whether we pick 200 or 400 or 386 i mean we can come up with some number that makes us happy but i i am coming around to your view logan I'd like to take credit, but I believe I copy pasted that from Corey. So, <laughs> and I'm coming. And I think I copy pasted it from Corey's you when you called you. me about it. Oh, okay. No, you didn't. You didn't make any calls. <laughs> you didn't make any calls. No, I did. I did. I called. Lisa them. doesn't like that joke. Yeah, I know a bad joke. It's well, getting late. 
Okay, so here is the way that I am going to formulate how I am currently thinking. And I would propose that we say anything that is 400 square feet or less, we do a three foot setback, recognizing that between 200 and 400, the federal code is gonna kick in. And so that allows property owners to have the freedom to decide on smaller lots, whether they want to put the setback or they want to go to the expense of putting in the, the firewall. But anything of dropping, right, exactly. Dropping the footnotes. Um, to vaguely reference the the fire code in that way, but everything between 400 square feet and up to I mean, I'm fine saying 20 feet um, Has a five-foot setback and anything above 20 feet would need to come to us for a CUP That's that's where I am currently Proposing that we go only you said I could really make a motion. Yeah, I you seconded that. Motion. I know, you kind of make a motion on that. <laughs> so I know that CUP was sort of brought up late, but again remember I mean, what sort of mitigating, I don't want to open up the floodgates. You know, Corey started this off saying, hey, let's be clear. Sure. Because you're going to have a lot of CUPs and how, well, what are going to be the criteria for determining okay, can where I, that building goes? Can I take but that, the CUP? But that exists I mean, right it's now. like, it's it, like that, a that's, CUP that's for a density. Struggle. I, I agree that's a concern, but it exists in the code right now. You want to exceed? You come okay. in with a CUP. Yeah. We don't know what the criteria other than I, the CUP criteria. I am not proposing that we actually add that put, in. Yeah, like I'm not proposing that we add that in. I was just saying that contextually so that we all understood mm. what the context was. So I would, I'm going to make a formal motion that um, that we recommend approval of the zoning ordinance text amendments regarding accessory buildings as follows. So accessory buildings of one story of less than 400 square feet will have a three foot setback accessory buildings one story well it doesn't even matter don't even reference stories accessory buildings of 400 square feet up to 20 feet in height will be a five foot setback period and we'll put a we'll drop a footnote that indicates that the setback is measured from any interior and or rear lot line and also um, include a reference in general to the fire code are we all clear chair on what that can i just is? make one suggestion yes before please second. do that second tier that goes to 20 feet let's yeah. just say maximum allowed by zone so all the way up to 35? No, maximum, because accessories are capped at 20. So. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So that's just, I, I think that that's yeah. a good suggestion, because then if it changes, we don't have to yeah. change our, our code. Okay. Then and on the fire code, maybe, is that the fire code and the building codes? So yes. The applicable construction codes? And applicable construction codes. And do you want to say 400 on the second tier, the 400 square feet or greater up to? Not, right. Not just 400 square feet. Bigger, 400 square feet or, or greater. greater. Or... Just so it's an or 400 square feet or greater or up to a maximum of 20 feet in or height. up to the applicable the zoning applicable oh excuse zone. me yes maximum. the applicable I, I the apologize maximum. up to the applicable maximum what'd you say <coughs> what did you say zoning code. zoning maximum allowed. maximum allowed under by the zone. zoning by zone. zone yeah by zone would you accept a friendly amendment with the suggested reasons for the actions a3 oh yes <laughs> <laughs> and I will, I will just make that part of my motion. And I would propose that for um, suggested reasons for the actions A through E. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion or debate? I just have a clarification. So yes. in your first motion, you said one story on the less than. And then you said yeah. strike that. Are you striking the one story from both I conditions? think we should strike the one story so from both. you're just both. saying you could have... Yeah, because it doesn't make sense at this point based on the way that we've redrafted it. Okay. So. And then that, um, to be mutually exclusive, the first one is less than 400 squ square feet. The second one is 400 square feet or, or greater. Yes. Okay. That's exactly right. Can Who I seconded that? I did. Are you okay with that change? Absolutely. Okay. Can I just, can, um, can we just chat really quickly about the one story versus two story? Yes, because we haven't closed debate on it, so. So uh, let's just think for a minute, the hypotheticals of if there's going to be like a 400 square foot <coughs> building that is more than two story, are you, are we okay with, it's, I mean, it's probably not going to be very tall or anything. So yeah. it's, 
but that's a three foot setback. It'll be this big. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine anybody building a two story tiny building. Yeah, and it would still get up. It just has, I guess you could potentially still get to 20 feet that high. What would that be? That'd be like, what, 20 by, what is that? By one. 20 by 200. <laughs> no, 400, 400 square feet. Oh, yeah. 20 by, I mean, could you have like a silo? Or I'm just trying to think. Like How do you guys feel? I'm fine putting back in the one story for the first for the less than 400 square feet. I'm, I'm fine putting back into one story. Because I think it's, you. I, I think, think from a practical basis, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen either, but I just think in those weird senses, it might be nice to keep that as the one story. And then we kind of merged the two, the next two tiers together. And True. so it would make sense to take that one story out so of that. So would you propose an amendment? So I would propose an amendment to um, add in the parenthetical <coughs> one story back into the first here yeah and i'll accept that logan will Second. you yeah okay so that that revision has been accepted and seconded any further discussion or debate are we all clear on what the motion is so maybe if you could just vote on that amendment first and okay. then i have one other clarification i second the amendment i love that lisa keeps us under robert's rules of whatever so okay so we are all going to vote on the amendment which is adding back in the reference to one story for accessory buildings that are less than 400 square feet. So let's start with you, Commissioner Daly. Aye. And let's start down here, Commissioner Aye. Hansi. Aye. 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 Okay, so now the motion on the table is <laughs> an accessory building of one story that is less than 400 square feet will be three feet setbacks with a reference, a footnote reference to the applicable codes, building fire, whatever, and then accessory buildings that are greater than 400 square feet. 400 square feet or greater. 400 or greater square feet up to the maximum applicable building code heights. So what I was going to suggest on that one is 400 feet. square feet or greater and then add the word and less than the maximum height allowed by the zone because you have to be that's right oh. okay I how you just said it there lisa okay now do i have a second on yes. that motion i think it's already been seconded so that's the motion that's on the table are we ready are you ready to do this okay um uh, kevin i'm going to come back to you last so we'll start over here commissioner work aye 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 aye, aye. Aye. Perfect. And the motion passes. Thank you. That was a really good debate. I, I Sorry for the wrenches. No, I think that it's good, Corey. I'm glad that you raised the issues. This is Corey. Well, and I think Corey, you can explain to the yes. city council. You know that this might actually solve the problem. The, these are we've we've. We really like that they've tried to address the concerns of the residents and that we're trying to simplify but also still give residents that extra mm -hmm. if they want to go the extra step to put the firewall in you know we're trying to give them those options yeah but I also I, I think i caught that message and yeah we'll relay that Good. to the council yes. excellent okay i'm gonna get us out of here folks moving on to item number four on our agenda so we're continuing our discussion of proposed revisions to the city subdivision ordinance cmc 15 subdivision and i will turn the time over to lisa to discuss the smallest chapter that we've been given thus far yes yeah. thank you so um just a reminder we're going through our entire subdivision ordinance and we're taking a chapter at a time um, to the Planning Commission just for discussion and then the idea is that we'll bring the entire subdivision ordinance back um, and then start our public hearing process. Um, so this tonight's chapter is chapter 8 dealing with small subdivisions and we actually made, I'm, I'm suggesting significant changes from where we left off with the consultant that originally drafted um, our ordinance. Um, we had two chapters, chapter eight and nine, where we had a conceptual and a final for the whole su small subdivision process. But rather than restating everything, I just want to use the chapters that we already have in place and just refer back to that procedure. So um, 
but this chapter does propose um, some significant changes from how we do it right now. So right now on a small subdivision, number one, it's defined as two lots or less. Under state code, you can have 10 or fewer lots and you can have a lesser procedure, but Centerville has defined that as, as two lots or less will allow you to go through this um, less significant procedure. That less significant procedure under our current code is a one-step process at conceptual with the planning commission, which in my opinion is not enough. So while we're trying to reduce process, this is one where I'm recommending that we have a two-step process for small subdivisions. Um, and that process under state code and under prior procedure allowed sort of a, a, a survey map or something less than a final plat. But staff, when we were going through the rewrite with the consultant said, we spend so much time with these boundary lines or meets and bounds, and then they have to do the easements that we actually end, end up spending more time. And I think the developer spends more money than just doing a plat from the beginning. So we're, we're recommending something unique probably for small plats, but staff would like to recommend that even if you're going to do a small plat, you need to do a, a final plat and have people sign it. Um, and that may or may not work. Maybe it's, it's too much process, but we have done some of these um, where the developer did end up just doing a plat. I mean, the, the boundary survey is practically a plat. Um, and, um, but what we're suggesting is in order to compensate for that, that we push it up to four lots. So rather than just two lots, let's allow um, subdivisions of four lots or less um, to use this procedure. And then we're suggesting a, a two-step process. And so what is in the code right now is just look at our, you have to do a conceptual and then a final. And conceptual would go to the zoning administrator and final would go to the planning commission. Now, as it's drafted, there's no public hearing procedure because remember we put the public hearing at preliminary. So there's a couple ways we can deal with that. We can either say, you just have to do preliminary and final, and then we'll have um, a public hearing at preliminary with the planning commission and then final with the planning commission. Or we can say, these are just minor administrative matters. They just have to follow the code. And so we're not going to have a public hearing on these types of applications um, and leave it as is. Or uh, a third option might be to say, fine, we'll have a public hearing at the planning commission level at final. Um, again, that's kind of late in the game to be adding any sort of comment. So I think my preference would, would sort of be that order. I mean, what I've recommended is conceptual with zoning administrator, final with planning commission, no public hearing. Uh, that may be too aggressive, so the, my second suggestion would be move it to preliminary with a public hearing and then final. And my preference, Lisa proposed, is remember the small subdivision is, is constrained. You have to have existing streets. You're not building new streets. You're not dedicating. We're not acquiring more right of way. All the infrastructure is in place into the street. They're just dividing off four lots off of that infrastructure. So it's simplified. The second catch of the small subdivision is that you're not part of a small subdivision within three years prior. So if somebody can't come in and just start piecemealing it under the small subdivision uh, parameters. So it, it simplifies it, keeps it constrained, makes it administrative. And at that point in time, if you're existing streets in a development and you're fronting that, you know what zone you're in. We're not rezoning properties because you can't do that. We're not doing any of that. We're just taking the zone that you're in, letting you have four additional lots with the streamlined process. Is there a need for a hearing at that point in time? And that's the policy question. And that's a, um, I didn't talk about this with Corey, but I, I did not add in those um, oh, criteria maybe I spoke ahead. because, well, as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, wait a minute, we're requiring them to do a final plot so they can dedicate streets, they can do construction drawings, but I, I do agree we could add that in. But what I'm thinking is if you're doing three lots and you have to dedicate a street, I mean, in my mind, four lots and fewer is, is pretty minor. Um, yeah, the, the, the struggle that 
I mean, I think it's I think it's good because we can create a process that handles the four step but, or uh, four lots with that. But I think you I think you have a bigger change when you're dedicating streets because now we've got to look at what type of street is it? Are we planning on a cul-de-sac? Is this just a, a spur extension now to a cul-de-sac? We have to we have to go to the bonding of improvements now, where generally the bonds are small when you're dealing with existing streets. And so I think there's some broader engineering issues, the grade of the street, uh, the city specifications, the cross sections of the drawings. And, and I, think, I think that's why this, we chose to be conservative. If you're dealing with existing infrastructure, you can do a small subdivision. If you're building infrastructure, there's more out. I'm not saying either one's good or bad. I just think Kevin and Randy and others, maybe as we come around, feedback from the commission, what's your thoughts? We'll go back and debate whether the four lot without their the handcuffs is a, is a okay thing. Well, and, and I'm fine adding that back in. It, it's sort of a, a definition or just another section to say these are the limits, but. Um, but, this, but this matches streamlined process under state. I mean, I'm gonna give Lisa her due credit for taking a, a shot at this. I mean, it, developers for wanting to streamline processes. Uh, a lot of your infrastructure and city specs are in place. They're in, you know enforced in, in existing parameters of codes. You move it faster, it makes housing affordability, not affordable housing, but makes housing affordability on a small lot quicker and faster for a developer. Um, there, there's some advantages, so I wanna give Lisa, yeah, good ask the question are we really ready to go there so what is your preference Lisa is it as it's written or is it that second option well if we add back in that this is limited to development with existing infrastructure um, I I mean I'm mixed I think it's six is whether to go with the conceptual and the final with no public hearing or I, I don't know. I, I've proposed what I was recommending, but I can see that it would be problematic not to have a public hearing, but they're, they're very minor and... And four lots is four, four lots. I'm but we have some, had some of our most controversial developments are the small ones because they're infill. Um, so... Yeah, that's my concern. I'm While I... But is that less of a concern now that we don't have uh, flag lots? Because those were the more co controversial ones. Mm -hmm. I still think anytime you're putting in, I mean, you could be, you could be taking two existing lots and, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you could be taking two existing lots, keeping one of the houses, tearing one down and creating a new subdivision changing things and that might be that that would be a scenario where you would the neighbors would be like wait 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 mm -hmm. i want to yeah yeah i don't know so i guess i could see doing it preliminary i i mean preliminary that has the the burden of putting the, the <laughs> applicant has the burden of doing some engineering to come to planning commission there's a lot more required but we also get a lot more information and it's not that complicated. So True. I could see doing away with concept plan where we only get eight items. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, that would solve it if you just take them both to the planning commission um, with a public hearing at preliminary. I, that would be my preference is to have a public hearing at the preliminary phase. I, I really do feel pretty strongly that we need to allow the public to have input even on these types of of developments and I, I do think that you're right these are the ones where usually you know flag lots or no flag lots um, I think that this is where people do want to provide public comment and I'm not so pessimistic that flag lots will stay out of our ordinance forever mm -hmm. I think that there is a place for those so I don't know. How and we, we could always see how these go as well and eventually direct final to staff or something like that like we did on others but 
I think it'll be interesting to try. Um, we spend a lot of time on these small subdivisions because the procedure is not set forth in the code. It just says at conceptual, the planning com commission can waive preliminary and final, and then we spend a lot of time helping them get to, to where they need to get for the subdivision. So I actually think this will, even though it, it seems like more process, it's going to make it more efficient for the developer. Okay. I don't know. I think there's another side of this. I think there's a lot of uh, big lots here in Centerville where you have someone whose house may be facing one street and it goes back and their backyard touches another. And we're talking about a situation where if it's not a flag lot, it would be frontage on the other road. Um, and I think we can't overlook the burden and cost on the uh, individual homeowner or landowner that wants to do something like that. I think it's something to take into consideration. And when we talk about developer, um, and maybe I, I probably need to better educate myself on this. I mean, I'm Johnny come lately, I'm here, it's my first time tonight, but as I hear this, I, I, I wonder if it shouldn't call for a little more thought, at least for me, I need to better. So are you, I guess I'm not hearing which way you're going. You want more process mm -hmm. or? Less no, process? no, I'm not sure I do. Oh. I think that uh, I think the points that have been brought out here are valid, but I think uh, and maybe maybe the number isn't four because um, if we're not allowing flag lots and we're not a, we're if we can talk about not affecting existing infrastructure, I think there's built-in protections there that could mm -hmm. still facilitate facilitate or accommodate a streamlined process for your person that could that I've described under that hypothetical. So yeah, you're supporting you're my about, original like, developers. I mean, a lot of small subdivisions are going to be correct. I don't know. Maybe you know, but would they be far more, you know, individuals yeah, instead say, of like a I, large I, scale developer? Yeah, I, I would say predominance of the of the two lot is an underutilized piece of property with an existing home. But you do see on the north end of town where there is. Uh, larger lots agriculturally zoned um, we have master streets that need to go through and in developing a <coughs> four lot subdivision might hamper the master plan street if you know how we how do we comply that verify that what's the conditions of that because you know that trying to be respectful the, the city council over the past five years has even protected the agricultural lot areas from further development by lack of rezone. So then somebody resorts to a four lot subdivision and you know how do we how do we make sure that we've planned the neighborhood out in the future appropriately with a four lot subdivision. So most of them are going to be the utter utilized piece, the streamlined, I'm cutting it off for a son or daughter or my Unfortunately, my parents passed away. It's a huge piece of property. I just need a, an extra lot or two out of it and, and, and liquidate the property and under, under the trust. Yeah, that's probably the Majority. predominant use. Yeah. Commissioner Workman, let me make sure I understand your concern. So your concern is that for less sophisticated property owners, that you do not, that your concern is that if we require a preliminary plat process, and require a public hearing at the preliminary stage, that that's gonna add burden on the property owner that's seeking to develop their property. Am I understanding you correctly? Yeah, I think that's a fair uh, characterization of what I'm saying. It's just, but it's not a sophisticated development. It's not mm -hmm. a large development, large scale. It's not impacting or adding to, infra I mean, in the sense that they're going to be another utility hookup, it's affecting infrastructure, but beyond that, uh, there's no effect there. I think that it might be something worth considering. Are you proposing that we eliminate the requirement that they be obligated to prepare a final plat that's approved by the city? No. So Lisa, help me understand the cost differential. So if I'm a small property owner and I have to go to the expense of eventually preparing a final plat anyway, you what's the additional cost going to be to me to prepare a preliminary plat 
I mean, aren't, aren't I doing effectively? Isn't that gonna? Isn't the preliminary plat going to go? The cost that I spend in putting together a preliminary plat effectively going to go into that final plat that I have to submit anyway? Well, it depends how we do it because if we do the boundary line survey, then it wouldn't technically be a preliminary. I mean, we'd call it a preliminary plat, but it it, it looks a little different. It's probably less money. I don't know how much. Maybe. Maybe uh, two to three. But, but you still have to do all your easements, and what happens is, so we require three public utility easements on, uh, on three sides of your lot, and so what happens is if they were just doing this boundary survey, then they end up having to do these meets and bounds descriptions of the PUEs, and it, it's just so much cleaner to have it on the plat or the survey boundary, and, and the, the survey map, in my opinion, seems awfully close to a plat. It, it doesn't have the signature lines. Um, so that might be what um, legal descriptions cost us usually from Thomas is good from four hundred and fifty dollars a pop. So if you need a legal description for mm -hmm. the that Thomas. easement, you need a legal description for the lot, and you, those could start to add up. So I think Lisa makes a good point. That sometimes if you just force the final plat, it's a cleaner way, and it's yeah. going to solve a lot of the problems. So you, maybe move the public hearing though to the final plat process because I still I feel like we do need to allow people to have the opportunity to have a public hearing and give input on these things and whether that's at the preliminary stage or whether that's at the final plat stage I do think that we need to allow people to have that input and, I, and in my experience it's typically I like to have that earlier rather than later because if there really is a problem I mean that gives the people the ability to fix it before they've spent all the money and gone through the final <laughs> plat to have this problem. And, and I think the advantage is the public, once you're at final, you should have crossed the threshold that you really are now definitively administrating the law. You're not figuring out whether it complies the law, you're administrating the law now. That should be the final plat. And if the public's invited in at that point in opposition, they look at the approving body of, well, we just yeah. told you we don't like this. Why are you still approving it? Yes. And if it's done in the same meeting, it's even, it's even this is what worse. the council struggles worse. with. If they make the same, you do it in the same meeting, it's like, well, they never even heard us. <coughs> so the council bails out and says, I won't make a decision. Even though it might be administrative, I won't make that decision. I'll bump it to the next meeting so it doesn't appear that I just ignored everything and bypassed everything you said, didn't consider it, and approved it. Mm -hmm. So... The later is why we try to bump things earlier because yeah. the public doesn't understand it's administrative decision applying the law and, and unfortunately they're thinking they're influencing a vote. Well, and didn't we just last week switch our public hearings to the conceptual of something for this very reason? I'm, trying, I'm going back through, I read through our meeting minutes. Think, preliminary. So, so we switched it to preliminary because preliminary. we're suggesting that yeah. conceptual be approved at the zoning administrator right. level, which will save time um, because we don't have to calendar it for the and but then having the public hearing at preliminary um, at the planning commission and so and if then we, final no public hearing but again at the planning commission level so if we switch it so that we have a preliminary rather than the conceptual and we do the public hearing at the preliminary then it's consistent across the board right. for yes. everyone which and, i think and is then maybe well I better know, yes I there. final at staff is that what you were going to say no I, you read my <laughs> mind too fast no I, I was going to say that but i went through <laughs> is that what you were thinking that's what, well, I, was that's, that's what, what i was thinking maybe we could do preliminary with public hearing at the planning commission and for these small subdivisions let staff do final i'm fine with that too i like that satiate the public by saying approved on the conditions of blah blah blah, blah, blah. and then you take care of those conditions luck, Ooh. right uh, you can do it under the law. It, the issue now is, is that you've just handed the land use authority from the council to the planning commission to staff, which it can be done. In fact, there are advocates saying move more to staff. Is well, this community is this community how ready for that? Do we, how often, when we get the final, uh, the final at planning commission, it honestly feels like a rubber stamp a lot of times because. Yeah. By that point, we've already hashed out, here are the conditions, here's the stuff, and they come back and they say, done, 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 great, moving on. And I, honestly, I don't feel like we have a lot of meaningful conversations up final. And a lot of meaningful conversations happen earlier. 
Agreed. And they always say, staff has been so great to help us figure this, 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 yeah, this, well, this, this out. That's what they more. always say <laughs> at final. They're like, staff's been so, I think staff's covered it. You know, like, do you want to say anything? Well, I think staff's covered it. Let me throw in an opposing viewpoint on this one, because I do think that while it was, while I could be supportive of, of staff doing this, there is some transparency that happens with the public when it comes back to the Planning Commission for that final site plan approval. It goes into our packet. The people in the community that are going to be affected can open it up. They can read the staff report. They can listen to the discussion that happens. Um, and I think that that transparency is good for our community and for the people who are impacted. I, my, my concern if we move that part to a staff level is that then it looks like it goes into a black box and some decision is made and people don't know why the decision was made in the way that it was. So I, I think I would still be in favor of keeping it at the planning commission level. Well, and in that case, maybe then what we could do is one of the conditions of approval that for final comes back to the planning commission so that we can maybe decide, hey, look, this is a this is a hot item. This is something that the public will need a little more transparency. But if it's one of these situations where we get a lot of these that nobody shows up, nobody seems to care, then let's just let the staff do that final approval and be done with it. I like that. Well, How do you feel about that, Shailen? Spell out a delegation clause. Wait, what? In the, in the condition of approval. So if people show up, then we're going to hear it again, no, and if just, people don't, we'll give it to staff? I mean, yeah. I'm wondering how you, how, how you would apply that in an um, objective, consistent way. How would you know until you get here if people aren't? Yeah. I mean, look, I, and I appreciate us trying to streamline it, but for the easy ones, it's going to take us you know, 10 minutes to sit down and do it. It's, it's really us. not that big of a deal. Well, it's not us I'm worried about. It's yeah. the property it's owner. I mean, that's another. Grandma died. Everyone's fighting, trying to liquidate. Corey tells me I got to wait another four weeks three. to get there. It's Christmas. Yeah, three, I'm three. six weeks out. Yeah. Um, I think it's a burden. I think there is transparency at the conceptual level. Like we do have a public hearing. You know, the, the information's out there. We can always be more transparent. It comes just to the expense of the property owner. I wonder if, um, Corey, is there any way that like if we were to move it to the final to the staff level, is there any way that you could in your development direct or your community development director's report or something, give us a little bit more meat in that, in those reports where you can s sort of not just say, oh, this was approved or, or I don't know, just like maybe say something like, I met with so-and-so on this thing that you guys, you know, approved with conditions. They met these certain conditions and they were able to complete their final site plan or something like that just like a like a short like a short yeah, from, from a from a courtesy policy that's not a problem we can do that i'm thinking from a procedural standpoint and and looking at lisa i mean if we if we have a zoning administrator just say is the land use authority to approve the final plat you know what you're discussing is how's that disclosed to the public <coughs> appropriately and I just wonder, Lisa, if there's a way that you could write in the land use authorities, either the DRC or the zoning administrator, and the planning commission still chair is still the signature, and then the report goes to the chair for signature. Yeah, I think with some of these proposed amendments, you know, for instance, if we're not going to take the plat to the city council, does the city council still sign the plat? Um, yeah, I, I mean, right now we have the council sign the plat, the city engineer, the city attorney, and the planning commission. Um, so I'd have to look into those about who we could take off. But I think the, the city council often accepts the easements and those things. That's why we have them sign the plat. So, but yeah, we get land use authority under state law. That could be designated to the commission to do that. It can be designated down to staff technically to it it's comfortable whether the political will is there for it but i'm just trying to figure out a way of, of making it administrative at the zoning administrator but there's an accountability outside of just the appeal you know somebody could always appeal that the decision was made the question is is how is the decision disclosed in the first place mm -hmm. and I, yeah i still sort of agree with uh, chair Heyman that just you know, we provide that transparency coming here, and it, it may be at the cost of time, but um, 
Because like, most people, I mean, just to argue at the time frame, not saying I'm arguing for the, the position, but the time frame for an individual, you know, we're running on three week periods twice a month. Uh, there's no way you're going to get a preliminary and a final done in one month. It'll take you a month and a half to hit agenda. So you're looking at six weeks minimum between that time frame to process to the commission. So Lisa, do you still stand by your initial recommendation that's in writing here or, you know, re again, removing that public hearing at the preliminary and just having it with the concept and the final? Oh, I think I've been, you know, I, I think that's probably a recommendation for the Planning Commission. I think both are persuasive. I'm not sure Centerville's ready to not have any sort of public comment on a, a plat, even if it's only four lots. I think that's a good point. And, and then I, I think it's also hard to, you know, not have that transparency of when it's finally approved and everybody knows. And, um, you know, then you've got the problem of, yeah, letting them know and who can appeal and when. and who signs the plat. So I was just trying to use the procedures that we already have in place um, to make it pretty easy. But I, I mean, I, I guess we're trading again. I still think it takes them quite a bit of time from conceptual to provide staff with a preliminary. I mean, every final plat or survey they bring in takes weeks to, to get them to final anyway. So we're sort of helping frame that. But it's a difficult one. I think, I think we're I mean, balancing I, interests of wanting I, to make it an easy process. I, I think the, the issue is how much is it, what you define as the parameters of transparency because in the movement going across the state, and you're seeing it more and more, is that when you get to this rubber stamp idea, it's just coming to the commission, it looks like a rubber stamp, and it just added time. There's more and more effort to move the land use authority down chain just adopt your ordinances, council, this is your legislative process. You know, planning commission, you need to be planning for the future and, and, and doing the code changes for the future and being comfortable with the codes. And staff, you're administratively putting in that place with always the appellate. It, I think the policy question is, is on four lots, is Centerville ready to say the transparency has been set and conceptual uh, or a preliminary with the Planning Commission sets that transparency. Everybody had a take into it, <coughs> and we've, res we've just heard it. Now we apply the law and staff implements it. But the transparency is being doubled because yeah. we're, we're always concerned that somebody's behind the Oz curtain doing something weird. Taking it. Shaylin, from what was recommended from Lisa and adding in the preliminary with the hearing and then keeping the final plat at the this planning commission, do you do you feel like it's a double, you know, transparency thing, or do you feel like the, that both the hearing and the final plat with the planning commission are necessary to achieve that that transparency, that full transparency? I think the latter, and that's just a, my personal preference. I think, and, and the only way to avoid the problem of combining the public hearing at the same time that we approve it and creating the issue um, that Corey referenced um, with regard to administrative decisions is, putting uh, it is, is separating those two and having the public hearing at the preliminary stage, and that's where people get to come and give their comments, and then we separate that from the final plat and I do think that there is still benefit in us going through that process, even if it is a tiny bit duplicative. I think that the transparency is worth it. And while I think that the system may be moving towards more of an administrative um, zoning administrator decision, I'm not sure that Centerville is that cutting edge yet. And I'm not saying that we can't get there. I just think, I, I don't think that the city council is gonna be comfortable with that. Yeah. And as progressive as I am, even I am sitting here a little uncomfortable <laughs> with being that aggressive, and that's just me. So well, it takes a team because if I make a decision, I get the heat. So it takes the decision off of me mm -hmm. and puts it onto your back. <coughs> I'm good with that. Do you have the comments that you need on this good. one, Lisa? <laughs> Say something. 
I know we're not really making a recommendation at this point. We're just giving you feedback. Well, I think there appears to be a consensus to eliminate the concept plan and change it to preliminary plat with a public hearing before the Planning Commission. And then there's not consensus on the second step, which would yeah. be final plat at either the Planning Commission or with a delegation authority to the zoning administrator. But Sounds like an excellent question for the City Council. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just pick, I, I might just say final to the PC with some comments that perhaps a delegation authority to, if we want to streamline the process a little more. Great. I, I think that'd be great approach. Thank you guys. Great discussion though. I really thought that one was gonna be fast. I mean I thought <laughs> I thought, wow, this is this short. How long can this take? <laughs> no, I I always appreciate your guys' feedback. Um all right. Moving on to the next two items on our agenda, which I thought that we had combined, so I'm going to combine these together. Uh, so the community development director's report. And Donna helped me out; she might have kept them uncombined. Nah, that's okay. And the city council report. So I'll turn the time over to you, Corey. Uh, real quick, I know it's late for you, um, and appreciate uh, your participation in the discussion. Next PC meeting, I have worked out a tentative agreement with the Plant Landmarks Commission to have a work session with you to talk about the Dual Creek Historic District and some design parameters that they have set. Is that still okay? Next that, week. Yeah. So the next one, the next meeting. So on June 26th, then it will be the hour before the Planning Commission, so at 6, a work session. They actually are supposed to meet after your meeting, but they sent emails saying we were meeting the Thursday before. So we're just keeping them at their word and meeting a Thursday before with them, and then they'll come to your work session. Okay. On the 26th. On the 26th. Yeah. Does that, is there anybody who can't make it? You're out, Kai. Kevin, does that work for you? I'll be there. Okay. Looks like that's a winner. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll plan that for 6 p.m. with the Landmarks Commission and communicate with them the final time period. Uh, we'll also continue the South Main Street Corridor. Um, I've, I've re-listened to that part that I, I missed walking out on you in the middle of the meeting, unfortunately. Um, I know that you want to, to talk about uh, uh, the design perspectives. You also brought up the issue of of the, the residential component being separated out. I've currently drafted that separation out. Um, and I was to come back to you with kind of a, how we accomplish a process schedule. So I plan to do that for that meeting. But um, I've also would like to bring to you before we go into to, um, other elements to it, uh, talk with you about, and maybe I ought to put it in the memo to you, talk about going through the goals, and I started to the north. I've rewritten the north area of Main Street uh, in response to the meeting comments about, uh, I don't know what to do north of City Hall. I don't know what to do with those corner pieces of property, and I've drafted some preliminary ideas, so I'm, I'm wondering if, if we can take it out of order, but I'm wondering if we could also take things section by section in the goals and, I, and, and suggest an order that you address it as part of that uh, accomplishment and then come back to each meeting with you on that particular section and the brainstorming ideas that staff has generated and receive feedback from you on, on those ideas so you can debate what your thoughts are and say, no, we don't go that direction. So, so I, I think I'll just not only just say, this is the order we're going in, but also some tactical meetings. We're gonna focus on this, we're gonna focus on this, we're gonna focus on this element. I, I like that idea a lot. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring that to you um, for your meeting. The conceptual site plan is incomplete for the Dave's Auto site, so that won't be on your agenda. And then anything Lisa has for the continuation of the subdivision ordinance. And then the last item is the council report, Sheffield Downs PDO amendment. They modified the recommendation. It is thus, remember there were green dots uh, for the standard in place, yellow dots uh, modified of the standard in place, and the blue dots for really relaxed standard in place. They put green dots on everything 
but the south row, the south row is all blue dots. So they increased. The so they increased the green dot. Because there was blue dots in the center and blue dots on the south row. And the, and the blue dot was the, was the least, was the, or what do I want to say for, to match there? Relaxed it the most for Brighton, the blue dots. And there were more blue dots than green dots and yellow dots. They said, no, we're going more green dots. So you'll stay the standard we approved, except for the southern row, you can go to the relaxed standard. If that makes sense, particularly for our new commissioners, like we're talking about dots. Yeah, star, star belly sneeches versus no star belly sneeches on these homes. So that's a report unless you have questions. Thanks so much, Corey. And turning to the last item on our agenda, so we're going to be approving the draft planning commission minutes. This is from May 22nd. We'll do this in the ordinary course, page by page. If you have any comments or corrections, um, let me know. We'll start with page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. On page five, I had a couple of minor corrections. So starting with line 37, Chair Hame had pointed out various, I would take out the words strike rather surprising. So it just reads Chair Hame pointed out various consequences of a lack of affordable housing. And then in the parenthetical that has been included on line 38, take out the IE and put defined as less than 30% of one's gross monthly income end parentheses. And then the rest of that sentence will read um, exactly the same, except after increased homelessness, include a comma, and negative impacts on children's education. Can we also not have on line 35 the then in italics? It yeah. just feels a little too strong to me. <laughs> Any other comments on page five? Chair <laughs> Heyman, can you repeat yes. the like, line 38? I might have said it that way. Yes. So Line 38 will read in paren, defined as less than 30% of one's gross monthly income, and paren. And then it reads the same, except that at the end of that sentence on line 39, after increased homelessness, comma, and negative impacts on children's education. Great. Anything else on page five? Page six. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Chair, I move to uh, approve the planning commission meeting minutes of Wednesday, May 26, 2019, as amended. I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Kevin, you still there? I'm still here. Oh, aye, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. Any opposed? <laughs> All right. And in the event, I don't know, Kai, if you're going to be here at the next meeting or not. So I am going to take just a one brief minute in the event that you're not here, and I hope that you're here for the next meeting. But if you're not, um, our sincere thanks for your service and your efforts and your contributions to this planning commission. Uh, we really appreciate you as, as a member, and you will be missed. Thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure to serve. If my name is not in here when I walk in, I'm just going to turn around and walk in. <laughs> <laughs> so Kai, remind us again your... Plans are oh, so do you I have wanna, a work assignment. Kai, do you want to do this on the record or do you want to? No, no. Okay. <laughs> we'll go ahead and I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. <laughs>